super jam-packed edition of the award-nominated Empire Podcast, we have three, count them, three guests. We have the director of Loki, Kate Heron. We have the star of Anne Boleyn, a.k.a. Carry On, Don't Lose Your Head. It's Jodie Turner-Smith. And, whisper it, we have the star of A Quiet Place Part 2, Killian Murphy. All that, and the usual news and nonsense, on the movie podcast that may no longer be able to go to Portugal, but all is not lost, folks. We've just booked a two-week tour of Chris Hemsworth's arms. <laughs> Man, those things are colossal. Imagine the size of his. Hello, pod. I'm Chris Hewitt, and welcome to the Empire Podcast. This week, I'm delighted to say that somehow we have been nominated by the British Podcast Awards in the, and please don't laugh, Best Arts and Culture category. <laughs> Best Farts and Culture category, more like. Mwah, mwah. Oh, no. And there go our chances of winning. Anyway, I couldn't have done it alone. Well, I tried, but uh, I am contractually bound to have a minimum of two colleagues of such lethal cunning with me every week. Uh, this week we have three. Please welcome Geek Queen, Helen O'Hara. Hello. Please welcome... A man with no hair who talks about film quite a lot. It's not James Dyer. <laughs> He's gone. He's gone. No. He'll be back next week. Yeah. It. Uh, it's Amon Mormon. Hello there. And we're delighted to be joined, of course, in the revolving fourth chair by the nicest man in showbiz, especially now that Hugh Jackman has been outed as head of that kidnapping ring, that international oh, Chris, kidnapping again, ring. Chris, again, no, what? as your lawyer, no, that's not no, true. No, not you true. cannot say that. It apparently is not untrue. True. Okay, entirely. untrue. Yeah. Well, no, I don't know. It's still Truth is subjective, isn't it, Helen? No, yeah. it isn't. No, no it isn't apparently in this not respect. in this case. No, no, apparently not. in this case, no, it is very, very untrue. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is the nicest man of showbiz, Ben Travis. Hello. Oh, has that Trent Bavis been writing stories about Hugh Jackman again? First he came for Michael Palin. Don't yeah. He came for Hugh Jackman. Yeah, yeah. He said something about Hugh Jackman being in a trader this week. I, I presume that was just stuffed with people that he was kidnapping. Um, oh but my God. it turns out to be actually yeah. a trader for an upcoming movie. Yes, there you go. Because there he doesn't go. kidnap people. <laughs> he doesn't, because he doesn't kidnap people. He does, and he put them all in that circus. I saw nope. the movie about it. Oh, he Whoa, didn't kidnap trend, anybody trend. in that circus, all right? They, they, they said there were too many <laughs> people, and he said up. it was never enough, and he couldn't. He just wouldn't stop. <laughs> no, he didn't. That never, was Rebecca Ferguson. Never. That was Rebecca Ferguson. We all know it. If anyone was kidnapping anyone, it's her, but nobody's kidnapping anybody. No so... one's kidnapping anybody. Oh, boy. No one's kidnapping. I've heard that Rebecca Ferguson does like to pull a bank job in her spare time. No, but... again, Chris, no. No? no? Again, another nicest person in show business until she sullied her reputation with all those bank jobs. Again, it's not a thing that happened. Anyway, welcome, everybody. We got award nominated. Amazing. Yeah, I British mean, we're not win, podcast awards. So let's, let's celebrate not, this yeah. bit. Woohoo! Yay! Yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Go team, go team. Shall we celebrate with the thing that I think put us over the top in terms of the award nominations? No. And that is the three fact structure. So if you don't know what that is, oh, you're so lucky. But you're, you're about so to lucky. have your world ruined. It's going to be brought down around your ears. Uh, so the three fact structure is a weekly segment in which my three colleagues of such lethal cunning bring in an obscure, arcane or unusual movie fact and try and impress me with it. And I give a point to the winner. Now, I am really, really excited about this week's episode, given it in our WhatsApp group. About 10 minutes before we began this recording, Ben and Amon were going... Do you have any facts? It's really hard to find a fact. The IMDb has not given me anything. Ben was saying that I always come prepared. I actually, I, I told I told Ben this on the WhatsApp group, but if Ben wasn't in the revolving fourth chair so much, the revolving fourth chair would probably be in the lead because we always, most of the people in the revolving fourth chair, we respect the, the, the feedback structure and we come correct. And then there's Ben who's like, Five minutes before the pod, I haven't, I haven't got anything. And I'm Dude. like, Ben, what are you doing? We're trying to win. We're trying to catch up. He's brought great <laughs> facts. Admittedly, they've mostly been from Disney University pod because, of course, they have Whoa. been. <laughs> They're a, all a podcast stolen. that's full of great facts. And, uh, but, but, you know. Just like Rebecca Ferguson. 
Chris, again, she's not what? a bank robber. I've, look, I've told you to stop staking out the Bank of England every night. She's not going to turn up. She's hit every west in, in the London area, and she won't stop. She won't stop. Anyway, no, that's not true. That's not true. That's absolutely 100% not true. Uh, but what is what is true is that uh, Ben is going to be the first person up with the fact oh this week. God. He's um, going to be punished for his lack of preparedness. Uh, Ben, hit me with it. I'm the sacrificial lamb. Okay, so (laughs) I spent a long time researching preparing this one, so I hope it impresses you all. I managed to find the trivia section on IMDb at last. Uh, That's how deep this research goes. Uh, And I was looking into A Knight's Tale, because I rewatched that for the first time. Great movie. Probably about 20 years the other day. I was at a country fair at the weekend, and there was jousting. Then I was like, I'm going to (laughs) watch A Knight's Tale, because it sets an unrealistically high bar of um, the amount of people like actually, like, chucked off horses and the the big pointy sticks smashing everywhere that was not happening at the country fair that i was at it was relatively tame in comparison but my fact <laughs> did pertains... anybody phone anyone gentleman never tells surely um but yeah my fact uh my long research fact relates to one of the smashy smashy bits from a knight's tale uh which is it starts with a spectacular joust uh just to get you in the mood get you in kind of the zone for People charging at each other on horses with big long sticks trying to like poke each other off. And in that scene, somebody takes (laughs) (laughs) a long hard stick to the head. (laughs) Golly. And uh, Ellie, your Captain America fan fiction is rearing its ugly head again. (laughs) Actually, that's what the second one's called, rearing its ugly head. Anyway, carry on. (laughs) Anyway, yes, Ben. Anyway. Uh, Stop yes. derailing yourself. Uh, well, somebody gets derailed on their horse. For the love of God. Uh, and that was basically an accident that happened on set. It was Heath Ledger's stunt double was riding a horse. They were doing a stunt for the film. And the uh, stunt rider coming the other way kind of got their lance in the wrong position, smashed Heath Ledger's stunt guy in the head, and he was knocked out and fell off the horse. But it looked amazing. So they were like, let's just use this. And that became the opening of the film. Oh, wow. And that is wow. my fact this week. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah, hell, I'll be the judge of that. I'll <laughs> be the judge of that. That's what I usually bring, <laughs> which is incredibly low. Helen always complains about going last, so I'm going sure. to leave him on to last, because here's the thing. You, you've you you've bigged yourself up already going <laughs> oh, with this revolving fourth chair business. <laughs> if this is about basketball again... <laughs> basketball honestly, are fun. They are fun. Yeah. They are fun. But other sports exist. Uh, I mean, see, <laughs> Hell's Bells, you can go second. I'm on can go last. I, I was uh, I had a couple of uh, interesting facts about old Hollywood figures this week, and I've decided to go with the less depressing of the two. Um, so you've oh probably God. heard <laughs> you've probably heard of the famous gossip columnist Luella Parsons. So she was yeah. one of the big figures in Hollywood history. I, I'm on. How Oz. dare you shake your head? You're in so much trouble. Anyway, so Luella Parsons Chris one of the, didn't know. One of I the, knew. He did I knew. know. Oh, I yeah. totally Luella Parsons. Knew. Yeah, yeah, I knew that name. She was one of the. <laughs> she was one of the biggest gossip columnists in classic Hollywood, and a very sort of conservative with a smaller C than her colleague Hedda Hopper, but uh, still a, a fairly large C columnist. And she had a daughter who also worked in the film industry, and it's her daughter that I want to tell you about today because I don't think a lot of people or enough people know her, and that is Harriet Parsons. So she was basically raised by Luella as a single, as Luella was a single mum. And she was raised, she raised her daughter, she sent her to the best schools. Um, that was kind of part sometimes of, of her deal and her contract negotiations was to get enough money so she could keep her daughter in these schools with the children of the rich and famous, which obviously was good for Harriet, but also good for Luella because it gave her kind of an in with all of these people. She appeared in a couple of films early on in her life as a, a sort of child actress when her mum was still writing scripts and reading scripts uh, for a film company in Chicago. And then she went to Wellesley College and graduated and moved into writing films via ghostwriting Luella's column. But what's interesting to me is she became a writer for Metro Golden Wind Mayor and worked for them for a couple of years and then became a film producer and worked for RKO for over a decade and actually succeeded in producing a number of films. And she was the only female producer of feature films in, who was a member of the Guild in the 1940s. Is that the fact? No. The interesting <laughs> fact is, because it's Pride Month, I thought this might be a nice thing to, to point out, the fact that she was gay and she uh, did all of this and sort of smuggled sympathetic to gay people messages in her films. 
uh, which was pretty much unheard of at the time, and managed to do it under her mother's nose, uh, which is even more impressive. And Hedda Hopper, her mum's rival, also supported her film career and said some nice things about her in a column. But she she had a lavender marriage. She she married a guy to cover up the fact that she was gay. Um, and later in life, retired to Palm Springs and quote unquote adopted a woman who was ten years younger than her. So legally adopted her. But the theory is that she was her live-in lover and that this was a way to kind of cover up that fact and give her some legal rights to her estate um, because there was no other way for them to be together because they were, you know, this, this woman was only 10 years younger than she was and a full grown adult. But I just thought it was a quite extraordinary life and she's somebody that not a lot of people know about and maybe more people should. So what is the fact? What, 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 I mean, pick, the fact is one? basically she existed. Look, I've got She nothing. existed. Okay. What do you expect? So you may think that Helen was speaking there for the last three minutes, but she actually just pressed play on the audio version <laughs> of her book. No, no. Harriet Parsons does not appear in my book. <gasps> oh my God. Is this an exclusive? I know. Uh, she oh. is admittedly featured in the latest episode of You Must Remember This, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, you, you, oh, you, you siphoner. You siphon <laughs> other podcasts. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look, Ben was not the only person to forget this week, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have been listening to Helen's audiobook, and if you liked those three minutes of Helen talking about interesting facts about <laughs> women in film historically, that is exactly what the book sounds like, so it's worth uh, yeah. So it's slightly audiobook. more, like, less breathless yeah. and more yeah. slow. Yeah. Well, we but... tried to record a version where I interject every now and again, going, okay, yeah, what is it? What, yeah, what's the fact? Get to the point, honestly. But uh, no, they, they rejected it for some reason. Say, where are the men in all this? That's what I said. I, as I said to you the day earlier on. You did, yeah. We were having did. a text exchange. You did, yeah. I said, hey, Helen, women have had it their own way for too long. Yeah, he did say that. That's the so, thing that he said. You know. <laughs> yeah. And he offered to step in. He offered to step in and like just correct Absolutely. the balance. You know, that's the kind of person Chris is. Bit of balance. I am all giving. That is basically it. Uh, I'm on. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, my fact today is to do with Danny Elfman. Uh, one. <laughs> you, awesome. you won already. My work here is done. <laughs> Fantastic. Is it, is he actually, um, is it that he's part elf? No. Is it that he's part man? <laughs> <laughs> is he all cop? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, uh, it Damn is it. in fact much cooler than that. Um, so I, you know, Danny Elfman, one of the greatest composers of all time, uh, mm -hmm. and his Batman theme is arguably his most famous theme. Mm -hmm. And composers, mm -hmm. they, you know, they get their ideas, you know, sometimes at weird times, sometimes it's in the studio, sometimes it's not. Danny Elfman came up with the idea for the Batman theme, a theme which we still hum today, mm -hmm. while he was on the toilet, and not just any toilet, while he was on the toilet as he was airborne, um, because he was on his way back from the Gotham set in London uh, on the plane, and he had an idea on the plane. Um, but again, this was the 80s. So, you know, nowadays composers can, you know, uh, record their ideas on the voice note and put it in their phone. Uh, in those days, Danny Elfman did not go anywhere without his uh, tape recorder, but he didn't feel comfortable recording his tape recorder next to a person while he was on the plane. So he so, hijacked the plane and sang it down the, the radio to the people in air traffic control. Is that, essentially, is that where yes. you're going? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he kept going in and out of the bathroom, which, uh, you know, had, <laughs> had the flight attendants uh, weirded out because, you know, this, this, was, this was before 9-11, but then he had this guy who was going in and out of the bathroom, getting more and more excited. And they were looking at him like, what is going on with this dude? So, yeah, that's sort of where he composed the idea. And he got back home and he thought he had forgotten the idea. But uh, ultimately, he remembered it. He was triggered by uh, something which uh, brought, brought it all back. And that is how but the Batman did he not have the tape? came did he to not be. bring the tape recorder in with he him? He did I bring the tape recorder in, but the plane was so loud that he couldn't uh, right. sort of, you know, you know, uh, hear, hear the thing properly. Um, so he, if he, he, he was worried that it was gone forever for a bit. But it came back, and that oh is God. how the Batman theme came That's to That's amazing. Be. So, right. Amon, just to quickly refresh people's memories at home, can you hum Danny Elfman's Batman theme? Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. It's exactly yeah. as it was when he came up with it. It's a cracking theme. It's a cracking it's theme. Thing. And that, yeah. 
is a cracking fact. You know what? He put his money where his mouth is this week, I think. <laughs> that was actually as told to me oh, by no. Danny Elfman uh, when I oh. spoke to him very recently. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> See, Helen, he got his fact from a primary source. Not... <laughs> I mean, mine not is secondary, secondary or tertiary. So- <laughs> I mean, tertiary possibly even, yeah. <laughs> Is it tertiary? I guess it would be tertiary. I guess it? so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, she, she's don't worry, Helen. There's always next week. Is there? Does there have to be? Actually, no? you're you're hosting the show <gasps> next week. I don't imagine week. there will be an episode of the Three Fact Structure <laughs> next week's show. <laughs> Ain't no fact. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, that noise you can hear is Helen snapping the neck of the Three Fact Structure, <laughs> and then just throwing it off a cliff just mm. to make sure. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yes, well done, Amon. You have won this week's Three Fact Structure. Jock went up to the revolving chair. And it's time now for our first guest in this bumper jam-packed episode. We are massively excited here about Loki, which is the six-part series that starts on Wednesday, June the 9th, this coming Wednesday, on Disney+. And is, of course, an MCU show that gives, at long last, Tom Hiddleston's god of mischief, Loki, the chance to shine in the solar spotlight, shorn of Thor, shorn of Odin, shorn of Asgard, all that stuff that's previously been bogging him down. The director of all six episodes is Kate Heron. And uh, she, as it turns out, is a long-term listener of the podcast, so our apologies to Kate. Uh, And we were delighted to have her in the virtual pod booth recently. She's still putting the finishing touches to the final episodes of Loki over in Atlanta. But she jumped on to a squad cast call with Helen and myself Earlier on today, just a, just about half an hour ago, something like that, maybe 20 minutes ago. Uh, who knows? Time is a concept and time's a concept in Loki as well. So we talked about that, how she got going in her career and what life is like living over there in Atlanta. Had a lot of fun talking to Kate. Hope you guys enjoy this. We're delighted to be joined on the Empire podcast by the director of all six episodes of Loki. We are very, very, very stoked to see Loki and very stoked to have Kate Heron on the show. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. I'm talking to you from Atlanta. Yeah, in the sound mix. I'm sound mixing right now. As we speak, so, you're, you're yeah. multi-tasking wow. right now. What's Atlanta like uh, in a pandemic? Have you been able to go out and see the sights? Have you been able to get to Atlanta's premier tourist attraction, which is, of course, the world of Coca-Cola? I, do you know what? I've not been to the Coca-Cola factory. I've been to the botanical gardens. Get out. They're very nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're more you're more of a meek tourist than a Chris yeah. tourist. Then. I, I, I go straight yeah, to the yeah. place that can make you any flavor of Coca-Cola and has a big giant polar bear that you could hug. That's basically where I gravitated towards. <laughs> the slam factory. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> but no, it's it's really nice. Like I, I really, I've been really enjoying Atlanta. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's like everywhere, right? Like, I mean, I've been here for a long time now, like nearly two years, I think, while working on Loki with lockdown. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's a it's a beautiful city, though. Um, Yeah, but I haven't seen as much of it, obviously, as I would have hoped just because, you know, the circumstances. Yeah, because of of bubbles and stuff. So you basically have to go from your (laughs) hotel or apartment to your car to the Mm -hmm. soundstage and and so on. But uh, yeah. But now and again, you get a glimpse of the polar bear and the, with a giant bottle of Coca-Cola and you think, <laughs> one day, one day, it will all be mine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Holidays are coming, guys. <laughs> <but> yeah. <laughs> other flavours other flavors of drinks. No, screw that, screw that. It's only one, I want to be sponsored by Coca-Cola. I want the lifetime supply. I want to hear one day, like, you know, I want to wake up to hear like a truck reversing down my street with just a lifetime supply of Coke Zero. That's what I want. So if we can do that, Thanks, Helen. That's, you know, another <laughs> drink. No other drinks are okay, available. All right. uh, Kate, so you're about to wrap. You are, uh, you're yeah. still working on, on Loki. Uh, what, yeah. what, what, have, what have you missed? What bits have you forgotten? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I don't even know what day it is anymore. Like, because all the cast are finished. And it's so funny whenever I speak to them that like, whenever I talk to Owen, he's like, you still in Atlanta? And I'm like, yep. And he's like, you still working on Loki? Yep. <laughs> like, yeah, forever, forever. <laughs> he's like, I've done three films since then. But no, it's it's been amazing. It's because, you know, it's six hours and it's it's um, very epic, as you guys will see. And yeah, it's been like making a six hour movie. So there's been a lot to do. So yeah, it's a run to the finish line, definitely. But I'm so, so happy to see it going out in the world. But it, it is very surreal because normally, obviously, you have like, 
a sort of morning period where you finish a job and you think about the work and but now I'm just like finished and people have all would have already seen the second episode so yeah it's like oh great it's done so yeah so has I mean what's it been like working on something of this scale because this is you know I mean I think for anybody this would be one of the largest things they'd ever done it's not like I'm dissing Mm -hmm. your previous work here this is an enormous enormous undertaking no I mean I literally made short films of like puppets and dancing hammers and like (laughs) so it's fair enough it's a fair question but no I I think some things that were really interesting like for example like there's never enough time there's never enough, uh, you know, money in some circumstances. Obviously, our budget on this is very different to my short films, but I think there's always going to be that's not a, statement. a bit. Of, yeah, <laughs> there's <laughs> bigger puppets. Yeah. I just couldn't get it then, man. No, but I think there's always a bit of puzzle making to be done. So in that way, some things were very familiar. Um, but no, I mean, as a director, it was a dream, right? Like I, I got to work with effects, with action, with these amazing actors, like. Yeah, it was a, it was honestly just like a dream job. I'm very grateful. So Kate, Kate, forget for a second that you spoke to me at length for a Loki feature that's in the issue of Empire on sale next week. And uh, forget that you told me all about how you you got the job and then spent six hours walking around New York with Tom Hiddleston. Forget all that. <laughs> and, and tell the lovely people listening at home how you got the job and then spent six hours walking around New York with Tom Hiddleston. So basically I stalked Marvel. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I've been doing that for years I, and nothing's yeah, happened. Yeah. <laughs> I I love Loki and I found out they were making a show and I was like, man, I just I have to get in the room and just find out what they're doing with the character because I love the character. So as a fan, that was kind of the angle. And I I remember I said to my agent, just call them every day. I was like, one day they're just going to have like a bad day and they'll be like, okay, fine, just bring her in. And it worked. Uh, So, yeah, I I basically made this like 60 page like kind of Bible essentially uh, to pitch. Um, I, I really went for it, to be honest. I, I mean, it had everything like visual references, music, a picture of me looking annoyed next to Thor. Like I, I, I really I just I filled it with so much stuff. Um, and I had the pilot script and sort of an outline for where they were at with the show then. So I had like, you know, story ideas, character ideas and like. Yeah, I just kind of brought everything in, that I could in my brain to it. And yeah, it, it worked and they liked my pitch. And I, I think I, I knew I was against some quite big directors for the job. And I just figured, OK, I'm not going to be the most experienced, but I'll just try, hopefully be the most passionate and just show like what the version of I did it would be. So, yeah, but it was kind of a whirlwind because I, I got the job and um, I remember that I flew to Burbank, obviously pitched to Kevin Feige and the team at Marvel and then I, I remember that I was at D23 not long after that. And I met Tom in that sort of 24 hour period before I went to D23. And obviously the last time we saw Loki was New York and I was with Tom in New York. So I was like, this is very strange. Uh, but yeah, we walked around for like, I don't know. It was it was basically, he was doing betrayal. So it was sort of between his, I think mm. his matinee and his evening show. Yeah. And we just spoke about Loki and, you know, we both loved the character and I, something that was really important for us was like making sure there was a good reason to go back to the character and just what we were excited about with the story and what the story meant to us. So yeah, it was a, it was a weird week. Honestly, I was living in like a sort of, you know, my bed next to my fridge in like a small room in Southeast London. And I was like, what's happened? (laughs) Like, so yeah, it's been a weird, it's been a weird two years. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Yeah. That is amazing. Wow. So um like did you have like favorite Loki moments that you that you sort of you know wanted to kind of build on or or develop? I think for me like I it's it's, it's so interesting, right? Cuz I think I think this is right. I think it's roughly around 112 minutes in total that he has across all the movies. But he's such I mean for me honestly like I love outsiders and I love that like, I always gravitate towards characters like that and I also love villains. I think something that I feel with a good villain is that you don't necessarily have to agree with their actions, but you have to understand them. And I think that Tom is like brought such empathy and wit to Loki and he's someone you can't help but root for, even if you're like, no, don't do that. (laughs) So I, I, I wanted to be part of that. The thing about Loki is, uh, we, we, we all love a bit of Loki here in the Empire podcast. And, uh, but the guy gets, he gets a raw deal. He gets undercut, and undermined at almost every opportunity 
without giving too much away, obviously, tell me he gets to win one at least in Loki. He gets he gets he gets a he gets a win every now and again, an unequivocal win, not like the end of Ragnarok where he's like reunited with his brother and then is strangled to death seconds later. <laughs> like, like a proper win is what we're asking for. Just thinking, what can I say? <laughs> okay, something I would say, because I, I send the trailers, and I think I've seen people commenting on it, but something that was really important to me and the team was just showing a bit more of Loki's magic and his abilities in that area. And I think, for me, that's a win. Like, I went in wanting to explore that more and just mm. show a bit more of what he can do as a character. So mm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because we haven't seen that much really and it's been more alluded to than it has been really you know demonstrated on screen yeah i think honestly it's just because you know he it's his character across the movies right like we we have seen glimpses of it but he's never had six hours before so it's just you get to dig into these characters in a way that you just can't do in a two-hour movie particularly with a huge ensemble cast as well so yeah so that was just yeah something on my list when i went in i was like we've got to do this <laughs> so yeah amazing i can't that's probably all i could say about getting <laughs> <whole> smashed. <laughs> okay i just want to dig back into walking around new york with tom hiddleston and what and what that is like because even though he's not going to be dressed as loki unless he's been really really weird um he must still get recognized and stopped every five minutes, every 10 minutes. Well, what's the ratio there? Yeah, I mean, it, there was quite a lot of people. I remember we were trying to talk. We ended up talking about the show in code because so many people kept walking past us. <laughs> I remember this one guy stood in front and did, I don't know, he was doing like stretches and I think he was trying to style it out. Like, I'm doing my morning exercise in the park. And we were like, you're just eavesdropping on us. Like We just ended up talking about our dogs for a long time because <laughs> we were like, well, we can't talk about the show anymore. So... Oh, no, are you frozen, Chris? Uh, no, I'm, oh, no, here. No, I'm no. here. I'm here. I'm here. It's just, um, no, it's just, this is my resting uh, Tom Middleton <laughs> anecdote face. This is the way I, I just naturally sorry. look like this. It's fine. Just keep gently swaying in the breeze, yeah. you'll be fine. Uh, uh, if, if I do this, if I just... <laughs> Lena frozen, but no, otherwise otherwise I'm good. Oh. Yes. So you're, you're talking about your dogs in code and not in a, in a sort of, so my dog, Thor. Yeah, honestly, we were trying to, I think I was calling Loki Arnold or something. I was like, so Arnold's story. And I was like, I could have chosen a better fake name for him than that. But like, yeah, but it was very funny. But yeah, but I mean, Tom is very lovely and it puts you very much at ease. But yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was slightly surreal because obviously I was in London two days before and they were like, yep, you got the job. So yeah, it was a strange experience. I think for me, like the weirdest day was when we filmed. I mean, you've seen it in the trailer, but like when he's in the actual Loki outfit, that for me mm. was like, oh, it's him. It's Loki, you know? <laughs> so I was just like, that kind of was a bit of an out of body experience. But yeah. It it is funny because like there are some there are some costumes in this job where you see somebody in that costume and you're like holy shit mm. this is really happening whereas like you know we're, we've been on sets Chris you know we're we're fairly not jaded but we're we're at least <laughs> vaguely professional cynical and, and can... bitter I would say but yeah <laughs> okay, okay. sure um, and you know most of the time you're kind of cool and then then something will happen I remember it happening with Gal Gadot in Wonder Woman when I first saw her in the outfit. You know, I remember it happening on uh, first Captain America, but like sometimes you're mm -hmm. just like, oh, holy shit, this is happening. This is real. Yeah. And then I always am in a panic and I'm like, oh, no, they can see. <laughs> they can see that I'm like <laughs> so excited by this. But because I like I I just think there's that thing, right, because there's there's that thing with when movies like I love obviously you guys love movies, but just when like, you know, the early Avengers film, like I love that film and like it yeah. meant so much to me seeing it and yeah, it was a bit of a weird full circle moment. It was like, oh, I'm actually doing this job and I'm getting to tell this character's story. And yeah, <laughs> probably a bit too late. I believe we filmed that a bit far into production as well. So I was like always <laughs> pinching myself. But so yeah. what was your first day then? What was your first what was your first experience of Tom as Loki? Was it was it day one or did you ease in with with other actors? We actually I think weirdly my first day was with Owen. Now I think about it obviously he's a writer as well and it's so clear yeah. from the moment you talk to him he's got this writer's brain it was the most detailed pitch i've ever done like because he just wanted to know i pitched him basically loki's whole arc across the mcu but then beyond that obviously we've set up this really cool new corner of the tv and um, sorry the mcu with the tva and he wanted to know you know what are the rules of the tva 
uh you know and just digging into it many questions i assume you guys probably have that i can't answer yeah. <laughs> so, like, you see both like Damn oh it. maybe um <laughs> but in a week guys in a week <laughs> in a week oh listen listen when all six episodes are are done <laughs> We're going to have a chat. Uh, oh, yeah. That is, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. That, I can't wait. Yeah. And if we have a chat in six weeks, Kate, and you go, you go, I can't talk about it. I swear to God. Um, <laughs> there's going to be a picture of me. I'm going to do a 60 page mood board. And it's going to be a picture of me next to you looking really disappointed. That's what's going to happen. I was honestly so pleased because I, with that Thor statue, because it was really weird. It was in, there's a shopping center near where I grew up and it's just been there for months. Like, I, I don't know. They hadn't moved it. So I was like, I'm going to go get a picture of the Thor statue. So I just got a picture. <laughs> next to it looking kind of like scornful but yeah it was very it was only it was a joke obviously but yeah i love that but that I love perfect. That you're, you're like method directing it's like <laughs> look how annoyed i am with thor i am the perfect director for this the first slide actually on my um on my pitch was sorry i just say it all the time and i have to always explain to american people and it sounds really bad but i'm like i don't mean it i just say it like i just it just comes out every other sentence like <laughs> It's just like a British thing. And they were like, okay. <laughs> but like, but I just thought I'd put it in my pitch just in case I said it, uh, you know, multiple times. 16 times, times yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's, that's actually very smart because, you know, some cultural things do not translate. And I feel like that's one of them. And they might get really worried and anxious that you're worried and exactly. anxious because you keep saying sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's smart. And I was like, no, we don't mean it. <laughs> like so now they're probably like what like every british person that's ever said that and i'm like yeah we never mean it but <laughs> anyway you were busy on on loki but did you keep up with the uh, the internet grind about wandavision and falcon and winter soldier wandavision in particular mm. got it really bad in terms of you know, and I began to subscribe to the mania myself in terms Mephisto. of, oh, that means the here come the <laughs> X-Men, here's Mephisto, who's Reed Richards? Reed Richards is going to be in WandaVision. No, no, never on never on the agenda. But <laughs> is that something that you're planning, is that something you're prepared for in terms of Loki? So after, see, after episode one comes out, people are going to go, oh my God, oh my God, Thor is going to be in episode three. It's clear. <laughs> are, you, are you prepared for that sort of stuff? I'm probably going to be really annoying for people though, because I'll just be like, I can't answer that question, guys. <laughs> like until that's it yes <laughs> but yes no i i think that's what's really fun though right because like i love i don't know as a fan of just you know enjoying stuff i think it's always fun to have those discussions and those debates like lost i remember i mean that's a long time ago mm. but i had so mm. many in-depth like arguments discussions with people about what the island could mean and where it was going so yeah no i and no, the fans are very passionate about Loki and I'm I'm more just intrigued, to be honest, like anything they might pick up on or anything with their... And also, I think the most exciting thing is there's things in this show that I really love and that mean a lot to me, but I know there'll be other things in there that I like, but will mean a lot to other people. So I, I'm intrigued to see, you know, what really chimes for people as well. And the sense I'm getting from the show as well, from having spoken to you and Michael Waldron and Tom and Kevin Feige and all, you know, all, these, all these people, is that it's a bit like WandaVision in that it's this big, bold, experimental swing for the fences, but you actually have more freedom than WandaVision in that you can go anywhere or any when uh, mm. in the universe with this. Uh, so A, that's incredibly exciting, but also it means that you have to be very uh, disciplined with what you do and how you, how you tell the story. Yeah, I think the thing for me that was always really important and like a central question of the show was like, you know, is anyone truly bad? Is anyone truly good? And, you know, can we move away from any past actions? Are we always defined by them? And I think having that as kind of a meaning going through the show, which does echo out, I think, across the show generally as a theme, I, I think kind of grounds it. You know what I mean? So even if you're going mm. off to fantastical worlds, it's always like, okay, well, if I take away all the bells and whistles of this story, like, what is it really about? So, and because it's still this version of Loki, the you know, the one that we saw in Thor and the Avengers, he hasn't had the chance to do the growing and the learning and the dying that he does yes. in the rest <laughs> of the MCU. But but he still he still got that sort of malevolent side to him. But he's still the guy who yells, "Tell me!" at, at Odin in Thor, and he's still full of all that raw pain. And that must be an incredibly fertile thing to explore as well. Yeah, well, it's just such a unique opportunity because, like. For one, how often do you get to work with an actor that's played a character for a decade? But then also building upon that alone, like like you said, like he's had, I think, one of the best arcs in the MCU of the last decade. But now we're like kind of going back, you know, 
so that not not to square one, but we're going back much earlier in his arc and taking him on a very different journey. So even just from like a nature nurture perspective, I was like, oh, that's really interesting because you know we've seen him react to these situations one way, but you know if we put him into something completely new, how is this guy? You know how is he going to turn out? So. Well, God, brother, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> guy, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, oh my God, you're in trouble now. <laughs> I know it's over. <laughs> no, I am really excited, and I, I think for me, like, it's really a show about identity, and I, I am very excited to delve more into like the Loki that we love with Tom, and mm. just yeah, take him on a completely new journey. <laughs> <laughs> is that it sounds very speely doesn't it it's like a new yeah. journey on an epic adventure <laughs> but it genuinely and is it genuinely is we've, we've really gone for it but it's because you've ended every single sentence with uh every wednesday on disney plus that's why <laughs> it, feels like, it feels like this is rehearsed for some reason um i'm i'm tremendously excited about it and i, I can't wait to see what you guys have have cooked up i know from you know and, and helen's the same we've 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 interviewed tom a lot over the years Mm -hmm. and I know from talking to him over the years how forensic he is in terms of his attitude towards his characters. I've seen his scripts and they're liberally festooned with notes that, you know, and he's, you know, he seems to be one of those people who sends 3am emails. Uh, So is he and what's it like actually directing someone who has played a character for a decade? I mean, how, how much leeway do you have in terms of I'm going to make a suggestion about this character but this is you know you've you've known this guy for for 10 years one thing i wanted to say was me and tom devised at the very beginning after we first met i mean like i said i love the character i think with any director and actor right it's really just about trust like he knew i loved the character but i think beyond that it's just that you know i've got your back let you know we we, will push it as far as we can and if it doesn't work it doesn't end up in the movie so Mm You know, and if it does work, that's great because then it's like new territory or some or another. Like you know, I think Tom always talks about his, you know, Loki's personality, like the keys on the piano. So it's like a new key for people to listen to, which I think is really nice. Um, I would say, like as people, we're both very studious. Like I'm very nerdy, (laughs) sort of the person that did other people's homework for them. So like, uh, so in terms of meticulousness, yeah, like I think I always really like that in a person anyway, because that's kind of how I approach stuff as well. Like I'm very thorough. Um, but something we did, which, well, Tom did really, it was just came out of a discussion we were having, but we, we devised this thing called, well, I call it like the Loki lecture and Loki school, but essentially because it is amazing. He's played him for 10 years and basically I got all my heads of department together, um, and all, and as many of the crew as we could, who were on board at the time. And I just asked Tom, like, can you just talk about your last decade in the MCU? Not only selfishly from a fan perspective, but just you know, like the character's arc, their journey, because it just might spark ideas in like what story we were telling. And he did this amazing talk and it was fantastic. And he spoke about, you know, Loki's emotional journey, but also just things like costumes and stunts. And yeah, I think because, you know, I was new to the MCU and a lot of my heads of department were. So I think it not only kind of welcomed us all into that family, but I think for me, it just helped us all know what we were paying respect to. Because I think there's a thing, you you know, it's, it's very careful handling of this character because you want to pay respect to what's come before, but also know that we're, you know, going back in for a good reason. Awesome. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. And uh, I know we've got to let you go because you got to finish the show. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's right. <laughs> Honestly, it's okay. I, I feel like this is this is an appointment we can get behind. You know, this is as re- yeah. as excuses go. It's a pretty good one. Yeah. Kate Heron is available every Wednesday on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Kate. Thanks so no, much. Thank, thank you very much. Sponsored by Coca Cola. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> now Cheers. you get it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. Cheers. Kate Heron there had a lot of fun talking to Kate about Loki and Loki. As I said begins this Wednesday, six parts to the series, this Wednesday on Disney+. Plus. And if you're wondering if we're going to be doing as we did for The Mandalorian, for WandaVision, and for The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, if we're going to be doing weekly spoiler specials on the Spoiler Special subscription channel, then the answer is, of course. However, because Loki drops on Wednesdays and not Fridays, as per those other shows, our spoiler specials will be going up on Thursdays, which means my Wednesdays, and especially my Wednesday evenings, are no more. But just for six weeks, it's totally fine. It is totally fine. So if you don't already subscribe, 
to our spoiler specials, go to empireonline.com forward slash spoiler specials for details of how to sign up or just check out my pinned tweet at Chris Hewitt is my name. And now it's time to tackle this week's listener question. And this one comes from at Nathan Ashman, at Nathan Ashman on the old Twitters. And he asks, let me just see if I can find it. Here we go. Yes, after watching The Mitchells versus The Machines, it contains a great love at first sight moment when Aaron falls for Abby. Paddington has a brilliant one too. What are the best love at first sight moments in film? Have at it. Uh, A few came to mind when I saw this question. I think Titanic has one of the great ones. Uh, Is this the ship in the iceberg? (laughs) (laughs) what's what's the moment what's the moment it's when rose meets jack on the upper deck isn't it is that is that is that a palpable see i know i I was writing down a list of these it's lust Mm -hmm. a lot of these are lust Mm -hmm. because i feel like at that there's a bit of intrigue there's a bit of like oh who's this there's a kind of building up to it there's like a oh hello who's this and then later it's uh they have a really good conversation and a bit of a dance and okay. what do you know they go and hold their hands out at the top of the, at the front of the ship you know so i feel like it's a little bit more of a slow build and actually most of the great romances practically all of which i have on my dvd shelves have that kind of <laughs> dynamic because love at first sight is a terrible 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 dynamic to play out unless you do it super well like for example romeo and juliet and I would allow Romeo plus Juliet through the fish tank. That <laughs> is like a great... like a completely different film. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great, great, great love at first sight. It's it wonderfully is. done. And it, it makes sense because they're teenagers. They don't know any better. So, you know, love at first sight, sure. Even though adults would be like, no, let's have a conversation to make sure he's not a total idiot. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. One which I'm sure is on Ben's list as well uh, is Little Mermaid when Ariel spots Eric with his dog mm. on the ship for the first time. Is that, that's a good uh, one. That's the first human she's ever seen, right? At that um, point. Well, she's because she's been fascinated with human ar- artifacts, and that doesn't seem to be the first ship she's ever seen, so she may well have seen other humans before. Okay. But this is the first one she'd lose her voice for. I mean, in fairness, like Prince Eric is famously the hottest of the Disney princes, um, up until oh, maybe Flynn Rider. Sorry, what? Look, I'm just saying, you you go on the internet, you ask about the hottest Disney princes, you're going to find some answers, Chris. You may not be happy you did, but you will find some answers. Listen, I've fallen down many rabbit holes, and the biggest rabbit hole of, of them all, mm. of course, is who is the sexiest animated rabbit. And it's a toss-up for me between <laughs> Jessica, who is a rabbit but a human, mm. and the Cadbury's Caramel Rabbit. <laughs> I'm sure certain corners of the internet would include, is it Judy Hopps from Zootropolis in that? Yeah, oh. and also uh, Bugs Bunny when he's dressed, dressed up as a girl bunny. Oh my God, hello, top I'd love at first sight, Shawing. Speaking of Shawing, uh, one of mine immediately was yes, Wayne's World. Wayne's uh, World. When he sees Cassandra and the whole dream weaver starts playing and all That's the little so sparkly stuff, like all of mine are basically from, uh, from comedies. It's just um, yeah. idiotic men falling head over heels for ridiculously beautiful yes. women who are completely unattainable mm-hmm. to them. And it's it's not just Wayne, is it? It's Garth as well with that um, mysterious Kim woman. Kim Basinger in Wayne's, is it Kim Bas- Wayne's World 2. Yeah. No, it happens in Wayne's World 1. There's the other beautiful oh, blonde really? woman. Do you remember in the like, okay. donut shop or something? He doesn't even know her name. And he has the whole foxy lady oh, dance yes. with the little oh, ears. Foxy, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, that's really good. I like that. I yeah. like that. And then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a moment where Austin Powers falls head over heels for Vanessa and every woman that he meets. Uh, foxy Cleopatra. <laughs> Um. Well, oh, what's her Heather name? Graham. In the, Heather Graham. Know. Yeah. What's her old Sha- Felicity character name? Shagwell. Shagwell. This is the Shagwell in the Spy Who Shagged Me. But yeah, because because uh, I think comedies they allow their directors to have a little bit more fun with how they express yeah. the falling in love <laughs> at first sight visually. So I've got a quite a few on my list as well, like the Lego Movie when Emmett sees Wild Style for the first time. <laughs> And again, you could argue that that's lust at first sight, but uh, it's I a think kids' it's, film about yeah. brick toys, so that maybe it's that's a not going there. Yeah, they don't have bits; it's fine. Uh, in a, on a similar, <laughs> they do. They connect oh, together, they Helen. Have so many bits. Oh my they god, more <laughs> bits than most, if anything. I'm going to throw in a couple of Jim Carrey ones. So there's okay. a moment in Dumb and Dumber when uh, <laughs> Lloyd sees Mary Samsonite slash Swanson for the first time, and he absolutely falls head over heels for her. Mm-hmm. Of course, given an extra frizzone by the fact that Jim Carrey and Lauren Holly. It, you know, I think got together in that film in in real life, uh, and then of course it has to be the mask 
when <laughs> everybody, Stanley Ipkiss, the audience, everybody in the bank sees Cameron Diaz for the first time. In the red ever. dress. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those things where he falls in love with her. Everybody falls in love with her. It's one of the great movie entrances. Yes, I'm going to throw that one in as well. That's fair. Oh, and Meet Joe Black uh, with Brad Pitt and Claire Forlani uh, just before he falls in love at first sight with those cars that hit him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another comedy one. This is a really highbrow one for the uh, awards judges if they're listening. And it's from Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. <laughs> <laughs> when Jay sees Shannon Elizabeth's justice for the first time in the movie's restaurant. Uh, and again, mm. she walks in and in slow-mo, he's having his fancy moment and there's like rock music playing. Uh, and then you kind of cut out of it, Silent Bob's standing there and and Jay's just kind of going, uh, <laughs> staring at it. And then he, he takes one of the movie's cups, kind of screws it onto Jay's erect penis and, the, and then the music in his fantasy like starts to dampen a bit and she comes over and tries to have a conversation with him and he's just going uh. and then at the end when she walks away he turns to Silent Bob and says dude I think I just filled the cup oh. <laughs> and that, oh, no. that my friends is cinema is that's that what, love at is first that what sight. we call love at first sight is, <laughs> well, is this okay. it, by the end of the film they're still together there's a whole sequel about the, oh, well, the, the products of that relationship so you know Cool. Yeah. <laughs> does it does it count if there's a love potion involved? Because if so, then uh, Willow, uh, Mad Mardigan, and Sorsha is brilliantly, brilliantly played. Now, is it first sight technically, given that he's seen her all day and she's kicked him in the face a bunch of times? Maybe not. But it's a new sight powered by the love potion, and it's amazing. It's so funny. Does Before Sunrise fit the criteria here? But don't they like? Like they're interested in each other, but you know, it's the whole point surely is that that's a kind of a low, slow building kind of a thing over the course of the night, I feel it, like. Yeah. Is it love at first sight? Like love it at third sight, surely. Yeah. It feels like it happened one night and things like that, where there's kind of this building love story, even over a, you know, enclosed period of time. Mm. I mean, Amon mentioned uh, The Little Mermaid, but there are a couple of, I mean, all the classic Disney princesses, because there is so little actual relationship there. It's just <laughs> these two people see each other and that is it. So you've got Snow White <laughs> and she sees the prince for like half a second. He's into her enough that he kisses her when he thinks she's been dead for a week and brings her back to life. Then you've got Cinderella, where they kind of barely exchange any words. They go for this lovely moon, moon moonlit walk at the ball. They are deeply in love, and yet he cannot remember her face, which is a bit of an obstacle later on <laughs> in the magic. film. It's magic. It's magic, Ben. And then you have Sleeping Beauty as well, which actually mm. has like a bit of character between these two, and they meet each other in the woods, and they're both singing, and it's kind of lovely. They have this kind of song and dance through the woods together. And it's this weird like Shakespearean situation where like she's a princess he's a prince neither of them knows it they think they can't be together because neither of the other is royalty or whatever it's it's weird and complicated no he knows he's a, a prince time. she doesn't know she's a princess neither of them know she's a princess that's it yeah but they <laughs> have been betrothed since the day she was born because it's just weird like that. Uh, another one there ben hercules and meg I, I'm not a Hercules person. I can't wait to get to Hercules oh, down the line yeah, when we do that on the podcast. Hercules? I've, I've seen it when it first came out and I barely remember it, um, but I'm now not allowed to watch it for another year and a half until we get there. So Until oh. you go the distance and get there. And at that point, I will go from zero to hero, which is the only <laughs> thing I remember about that film. <laughs> any more for any more. Oh, I feel like there are lots more. Honestly, I think that Love at First Sight is probably best played as a trope or a you know in in a disney movie or to be undermined or a teenage thing i mean you know it's brilliantly brilliantly subverted in frozen where yeah. she basically immediately decides that she's in love with um hans and he's a dickhead like he's yep. the worst the actual worst um hans so i thought that canceled. was really great mm. <laughs> let's cancel that guy so yeah, yeah. And it's subverted really nicely as well in Enchant Enchanted, when mm -hmm. um, you've got James Marsden and Amy Adams, and they kind of fall in love at first sight. But then it's actually like, what do you what do you guys like about each other? What are you into <laughs> with each other? And of course, he ends up with Idina Menzel instead. So yeah. he ended up with a different Disney princess eventually. Exactly. Hells bells! I'm surprised you haven't said uh, a Wonder Woman. Fair. B. Fair. Serena de Bergerac. I mean, yeah. What, so Wonder Woman kind of repeats what. The Little Mermaid did, at least as far as Steve Steve Trevor is concerned. He wakes up on a beach and there's this gorgeous woman 
not quite singing over him, but she might as well be. Um, and, I had noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she, I think, is intrigued, but probably love takes a bit longer for both of them because I think they're both wary enough. I think they're both horny on main from the, the well, second they meet each other. But. Yeah, but you know, they're growing up people about that. Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac is interesting because the love at first sight there is between Roxanne and Christian. So the Vincent Perez character, which totally makes sense. Ambroche and Vincent Perez were two of the most beautiful people in the world at that point. But the true love in that movie is between Cyrano and Roxanne and she's known him all her life. So it's not quite right. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, love at first sight is such a strange... Uh, yeah, have you guys ever had that? Have you, you know, let's, let's get personal for a second here. Have you, ever, have you ever experienced that? Crush at first sight, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. sometimes in movies, because everything's so heightened, you have to feel that connection right away. For example, in order for American Werewolf in London's finale to work, you have to believe that David Naughton's David would fall in love immediately with Jenny Agutter's nurse Alex mm. and she would fall in love with him. So there, there's an emotional point to the climax. Uh, so it's such a, it's such a weird thing that pretty much only works in movies. Mm. I'm also remembering um, Fish Got Wanda. I'm pretty sure John Cleese falls in love with Jamie Lee Curtis right away. This thing he sees her in that uh, also. Uh, there's a couple I'm going to throw out real, real quick. Uh, so Back to the Future Part 3 has a really sweet one where Doc Brown meets he saves... Clara from certain death and then she reveals herself to be Mary Steenburge and you know they immediately fall in, fall in love with each other it's so beautiful um, Gremlins 2 when the lady gremlin sees Robert Picardo's character and she just <laughs> is oh that ain't love baby that ain't love oh it's love it's love it ends with them <laughs> it ends with them getting married and her seducing him and him going you know what in for a penny in for a pound she's no caramel Capri's caramel bunny but oh, you know Lord. it'll do um <laughs> Superman the movie's got a lovely one as well. You know, which is where Clark, there's got kind of two, hasn't it? Because so Clark falls in love with Lois the minute he sees her. And then Lois falls in love with Superman oh. the second she sees him. The fact what that he is triangle. saving her from certain death. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Those three really got to work this out. And I'm going to mention as well, uh, Ray's in Arizona. Oh. When Nicolas Cage meets Holly Hunter for the first time. That's so good. He's a criminal. She's a cop. It should never work. It totally does. And uh, Amon, I know you wanted to talk about The Godfather real quick. Yeah, when uh, when Michael Corleone meets Apollonia, uh, that is a great moment. Uh, I believe the line is something akin to, it looks like you've been struck by a lightning bolt. And uh, yeah, he's... he's uh, it's, it's, it's a great moment for... Michael. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just a great moment for Michael. It's a great moment for her. It's a great but, moment for but, audiences. It's a great moment for cinema. It's just, it's just a great moment. Uh, so, well done then. Is it love at first sight in Cinema Paradiso? When he meets her in school? When they're teenagers? Do, do kids and teenagers count? I don't know. I'm, I'm, Romeo I'm and gonna, Juliet do. I'm only going to allow... Animated characters and Jim Carrey. That's all I'm going to allow. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. In that case, we're done. Woo. Animated characters, superheroes, and Jim Carrey, and that's it. <laughs> I will allow <laughs> Thor and Jane Foster, but I will not allow cinema ooh, parodies. Ooh. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Where? No, behind you. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> no, um, uh, Zhang Ziyi's character uh, falls in love at first sight with the bandit who steals her comb. Good yes. one. And vice versa. Perfect. I like it a lot. Uh, anyway, I'm sure that was deeply unsatisfactory, and I know there are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands that we've missed off, as ever do set us straight on Twitter. Uh, but if you want to have your question read out in the Emperor Podcast, you can get in touch with us via one method and one method only right now, which is Twitter. I'm at Chris Hewitt. You can either slide into my DMs, be nice, folks, or you can reply to any of my hilarious tweets or wait for a panicked shout-out every now and again. Although, once again, I will say we are solid. We are Good with questions for the next, I'd say, three or four episodes. Uh, but you never know. Keep them coming. I'll, I'll build the stockpile. I'll build it high. Then set fire to it. You'll be able to see it from miles around. Time now for our second guest on this episode, Anne Boleyn. It's not Anne Boleyn, by the way. She is, well, dead. But she was also the second wife of Henry VIII. Probably, in fact, not even probably, his most famous wife of six, of course, um, and one who had a huge impact on the future slash history of this country. She's been brought to life in a three-part drama which aired on Channel 5 this week called Anne Boleyn, and in it she is played by the wonderful 
Jodie Turner-Smith, who burst onto the scene in last year's Queen and Slim alongside Daniel Kaluuya and was recently seen alongside Michael B. Jordan in Without Remorse. But this is very much the Jodie Turner-Smith show. She is in every single scene in this three-part drama and she is fantastic. So I jumped at the chance to talk to her about playing Anne Boleyn, obviously, about her approach to acting and a few other little surprises as well. Now, I will say that Jodie was in a room in New York. It was quite echoey. She didn't have headphones. We were on Zoom. So the audio isn't fantastic, shall we say, in certain places. But hopefully you can muddle through because I had a lot of fun talking to her and uh, hope you guys do too. Here we are. Jodie Turner-Smith, do please enjoy. We're delighted to be joined in the Empire Podcast by the star of Anne Boleyn, Jodie Turner-Smith, how the devil are you? I am so good. Thank you very much for asking. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. No one ever asks me how I am. So thank you for that. Because nobody else cares except for me. (laughs) Precisely. Precisely. Um, Where the devil are you, more precisely? Uh, I'm in New York City. Yeah. Okay. What's the weather like over there at the moment? It's actually nice, which is good because the last three days, actually the day before yesterday was was wet the last of it but it was like three days of just absolutely shit weather i was like are we in england what's going on you know what today's the first day of proper summer over here you're you're missing it i heard i heard i was some i was speaking to someone about 20 minutes ago who told me it's really nice weather it is he actually said it was too hot so he was happy to be in his little box in the aircon so i was like okay british it's like complaining about the shit weather then you get when it gets warm it's like oh too fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when there's a perfect storm, isn't there? It's, like, it's got to be 19 to 20 degrees and that is it. Maybe a little bit of drizzle during the day and then we're happy. <laughs> and that's the sort of stuff you must miss because New York, my God, they can get muggy the, this time of year. I know, actually, and, and I'm happy to be on my way out. I've only got about a couple of weeks left here and um, I'm I'm happy to miss the, the muggy, dis- like this city because everything's just so close together and on top of each other when it gets really hot in the summer it's disgusting <laughs> it's disgusting my kind of town um but listen jody i've i've gone full british and we've done nothing but talk about the weather <laughs> already what the hell is going on it's not what i intended to do um but we're talking just before anne boleyn airs on channel five and by the time people hit listen to this it'll be friday so it'll have just finished but i wanted to ask about you're obviously in new york i mean you're not going to get channel five over there so do you have a plan to watch each episode or are you one of those people whenever a tv show that you're in is on that you stay far away from it what's your what's your plan um well no i think it's so good I, and i think at, at this point it's it's part of the thing to sort of like you know i i I wish it was airing here so I could like live tweet and do things like that with people. But no, I, I, I got um, I got I got the super official cheeky actor link. So I actually showed my family the first episode last night. And um, while I won't be watching along with everybody in the UK, I'm happy to say I have seen tonight's episode and I'm really proud of it. It's fantastic. It really is. I have to, I have to ask, though, before we get into the show. Do you, does your link work the same way my link works, which is every 20 minutes a disclaimer comes up on screen going... Yeah, right through my face as yeah. well sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's impolite at best, isn't it? <laughs> that's outrageous. You're, like, it's like you're the star of the show. You should get like an editorial disclaimer-free screening link, surely. Listen, once I was watching something that I did and it was a, they gave me like one of those screener links and it was literally like the watermark never disappeared. I watched the whole thing with the watermark over and I was just like, this is really... And my husband was like, are they for real? Like they're just leaving it there the whole time. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> just like yeah. right in the middle of the screen the whole time. I was like, I don't know what they really expected me from me, but I would appreciate it if it disappeared occasionally. I'm the sort of guy who gets, you know, that, that and the Henry the Henry the Eighths and his six wives, that rhyme. Yeah. I can never get that into my head, but I do know Anne Boleyn beheaded. Uh, and she's the most famous of Henry the Eighth's six wives for sure. What did you know about her going into this? 
Um, obviously, yes, I also knew that little sort of sing song thing, which I just tried to remember a minute ago and realized it's fallen through my brain. But I just became a mum, so I get an excuse because there is a thing called mum brain and it's real. It's very real. Um, mum brain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Baby brain, mum brain. That's what it's called. I, I've, I've never heard it called mum brain before a love lamp because of mum brain membrane. So a mum brain membrane? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, because mum brain, because it's like your brain becomes like a membrane and things just slide through it like Swiss cheese holes. It's <laughs> really unfortunate and endlessly frustrating. I can imagine. It feels like being stoned all the time. Okay, anyway, um, I was obviously familiar with Anne Boleyn, but really more so through the lens of just being one of Henry's wives, you know, and then just what's scandalous about her. Because that's, you know, she's certainly been written about as like this scandalous woman. And so doing this show was really interesting to kind of do this deep dive on her. And also the most surprising thing was to find out that there's actually no record of Anne Boleyn in her own words. Like no diary entries, no letters that she wrote to somebody else. Like literally it's, it's, it's the one thing in the uh, book of hours, um, but that's it, you know? Um, and wow. so I thought that was really interesting because what that told me was number one, you know, I'm familiar with all the different interpretations of Anne Boleyn that have come. I mean, she, there's a reason she's endlessly fascinating to people. Um, but it told me that, you know, that means there's so much room really to interpret who she might have been based on the experiences that she had in her life. Like, and that was really what I got into a lot with the historian that we worked with, Dan Jones. You know, I had all this, I just like fired up all these questions from him and we kind of created this Anne Boleyn Bible. But, you know, I was just curious about, you know, what would it create in a woman? What kind of, you know, desires would she have based on the fact that she grew up, spent so much time in the French court, was always around these really powerful female leaders, you know? What was the psychology behind that kind of an upbringing? And then what would that mean about what she felt she was bringing back with her to England, you know? And what she was trying to bring to England and what she was trying to push forward to England and, and her own faith and relationship to God and how it was just, it was more than just, I think it was, it was much more, I believe, deliberate and calculated than just like, oh yeah, this, this separation from the Catholic church is just happening because, you know, uh, because you want to get in bed with me. You know, it was, there was just so much more at work, you know, the dissolution of the monasteries and, and all the things that she was doing and, and, and heading behind the scene. It's just really so fascinating. And it's, it's a, an incredible portrayal of her as well. And there's so much going on here. There's so much, going on with uh, how you play the role, her poise, her confidence in the first episode. And that's something that she never loses, even as she is being conspired against. And this is the one of the things that really felt timely to me, that you know she's this incredibly brilliant, bold, brave woman who is being conspired against by the patriarchy and conspired against by inadequate men who are whispering about her in murky rooms and that felt so of the moment that felt so of the now yes i mean it's just so relevant to this moment and it's so it feels so uh modern this idea that like shocking men being threatened by a woman who is powerful <laughs> it's like, okay some things really haven't changed and i thought that was so interesting it makes you look at every woman in history differently. You know, the way that they're talked about, you have to really ask yourself, take it with a grain of salt. Like, are they being talked about this way because they truly were horrible? Or are they being talked about this way because they were powerful and feared and thus men decided to disparage them? Absolutely. And is that, is that something that appealed to you whenever this, this came your way, um, this role? Absolutely. I think it is part of a woman's journey to understand being marginalized by the patriarchy and as a black woman I absolutely understand as well 
you know, what it means to feel marginalized and um, the desire to push past that, you know. And also it's just that, you know, this role, what this role was about, the, the, it was about distilling it down to all of those human emotions that I think anybody can understand and that we all live in some way, shape or form together, you know, desire, ambition, love, betrayal, regret, you know, all of these things that loss, heartbreaking loss, not being, you know, being considered only a, a, as valuable as your reproductive organs. I mean, these are not foreign concepts. I have to ask, I mean, again, if anyone's listened to this and you don't know what's happened to Anne Boleyn, uh, check it out. It's on Wikipedia. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this isn't a spoiler necessarily, but uh, I have to ask when you filmed the execution scene and what that was like for you. Oh, it was so emotional. You know, when we were filming, there's something about, and, you know, they picked the most incredible locations for us. And I think there's so much, all of these historical buildings, you know, across Britain, they have, obviously, they carry, and I believe, I believe in spirits. I don't know about if you're a person who believes in the spiritual realm or spirits, but I, I believe in all of that. And, and I think that in older buildings and places where things have happened, like you feel the energy, you know, and there is something that feels so electric about channeling a soul that has passed in a space that is filled with other souls, you know, and there was just so much about it. I mean, there was not a dry eye on that scaffold. Everybody was just, and again, it's about it's the thing I was saying about when we first started, you know, all these actors holding the space for something magical to happen. And then even the essays that were there, the supporting artists, you know, I remember there was a gentleman to the right of the scaffold who was just obviously like he was playing that he was a, an Anne Boleyn devout follower and lover of Anne Boleyn. And just the whole time that I was on the scaffold, he was just like bowing, like, and so broken that I was being killed. And every time I looked over there, I would just absolutely lose it because I was just so moved by this essay who was just, I mean, and that's the thing, you know, everybody is a part of what we're doing and everybody is holding the space. And when people just bring that kind of energy to it, it just electrifies it. And, you know, there's actually, I don't know if it made it, I haven't watched the final, final, final of the third episode, but there is a speech that, you know, I, I did that day when I was shooting it, that was just so incredible to do and to shoot and I feel like we all bonded so much as actors in that space that day you know and it was raining and it was just like it was just it the energy in the space just felt so heavy and like electric and it was just it was magical I really loved doing that you know I felt like I had her blessing amazing and uh, I presume you were trying not to catch Cromwell's eye in that case <laughs> You know, Barry actually wasn't there when I filmed that. You know, they he wasn't there, like staring at me from the crowd. So, so i um, But you know, I, I I did have to like, you know, see him in the crowd. But he actually wasn't there because I'm glad because Barry is like such a lovely guy and so hilarious and hysterical that I feel like it would have taken me. It might have taken me a bit out. And you just look at his face as well, and you just want to like hug him. He's so like he's so handsome and lovely. So I, I'm, I think I'm glad that Barry was not in front of me. I just pretended that I was looking at him. Was it that old classic thing where his he was basically just a tennis ball on a stick? And it's like, this is Cromwell. Now look at him. Yo, you don't like him. He doesn't like you. Boo. <laughs> was, it, was it basically like that? Exactly. I was just like looking at, you know, because there's, there's, there's people like in the crew just there. And I would just like look at them instead. And, it, and bless their hearts. You know, everybody in the crew is trying not to look at me because they don't want to distract me. Do you know what I mean? But I'm just like. But it was actually really, and it, that's the other thing. It was really, I, I remember Jodie Williams, who was my personal on set, you know, every time she would come to do my touch-ups, she'd be crying and I'd be like, You're, and, and so then she would make me cry again. And then we were just a mess. And Chalisa, who plays Madge, oh my God. Every time, because, you know, we have these tender moments up there on the scaffold and I'm so sad that all of them don't make it into it. But she, every time I would just look at her face, I would just lose it. I mean, everybody just held the space so beautifully. It was so emotional. It was so. The long answer is the short answer of that long one I just gave. It, it was emotional. <laughs> In the editing, that's what I'll use. I'll just use that. 
I have to go back to what you just said there, Jody, about believing in the supernatural or believing in, in, in spirits. So have you ever had an experience, a supernatural experience? Yeah, well, I feel like, first of all, I don't think I've ever talked about this with anyone before, but I think that when I was a child, I used to astrally project. Because I remember as a child that I used to be able to do this thing where it's like I could walk on the ceiling. Like I, I would just suddenly be able to like be on the ceiling and see the room from upside down. Interesting. And I honestly, honest to God, I think that it's because I was actually projecting. I know I'm going to sound like an absolute nutter when people sound like this, but I honestly, and I mean, I mean, young, a young, young child, you know what I mean? I'm talking about like probably between the ages of like three and six years old. Okay. Okay. So what, what happened? Did you, did you just lose this ability overnight? Is it, is it that thing you begin to put away childish things and that part of your brain just loses it? Yeah, I really do. You know, in the way that like, you know, children with imaginary friends and things like, I really feel like it was that kind of thing. Cause I remember it was a thing I used to do all the time. Like I would be able to like go onto the ceiling and see the room from up there. And then the other thing why I believe that I was as well, is I used to sleepwalk. Okay. Like, like heavily sleepwalk to the point where my, my stepdad, he actually put, you know, the motion alarm in the house because he was worried that in the night, because I mean, I used to do really strange things. I mean, and my mom said it was, it was definitely a time when she woke up and I was just stood at the foot of her bed, just like looking at her. <laughs> and I think that has also to do with actual projection. It may well be. Well, Jody, I'm going to blow your mind. What if well, you're still asleep and all this is still a dream? Well, it's a really fucking brilliant dream. And so, you know what? Let's not wake up. <laughs> so you have podcasts in your dream? Apparently. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Amazing what stuff. What a time to be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to, have to let you go. But Jody Turner-Smith, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. So that was Jody Turner Smith. And obviously, if you missed Anne Boleyn when it aired on consecutive nights this week on Channel 5, do not despair. Do not despair because you can absolutely catch up with the show now. It is available on My5 and the My5 app. And I believe also as a box set to people who are subscribers to Sky and Now TV also. Well worth checking out. Time now to delve deep into this week's movie news what have you got folks what has been keeping you awake at night going i can't wait to see that film i'm already super pumped for creed 3 and then <laughs> well you've been down the gym like with yes. lifting really heavy weights you know michael b <laughs> Jinspiration uh has has helped me out with that you know i am slowly but surely it's going to get to a stage where looking at michael b jordan is like it's going to be like looking in the mirror I, yeah, I, yeah. I face. Um, <laughs> face off two is going to be you and him, isn't it? Basically, <laughs> hey, I would watch and I would star in that for sure. Amon is now he's evolving his catchphrase now. Would watch, would write, would direct, would star, would produce. But yeah, Jonathan Majors, who is has been on the come up to put it mildly uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, he is in talks to be uh, Michael Jordan's Michael B. Jordan's adversary in that film. And that just makes me very excited, um, you know, with uh, him being in Lovecraft Country and with him just booking a role in the MCU as Kang. And now uh, to be starring in Creed 3 just makes me very excited uh, about uh, his future and his role uh, in this movie. I, I'm unsure exactly sort of where this movie is going to go at this point, because it feels like they've exhausted a lot of the options when it comes to this franchise uh, not just with Rocky, but also with Creed. But his casting makes me very intrigued just on the back of the work that I've seen from him. So, yeah, so he's going to exciting. be the kind of the nemesis character, so presumably yeah. the op opponent boxer. I mean, is there a parallel to Mr. T this time? Is that what we're thinking? I don't know. I'm not saying it's uh, it's going to be a do over, but I, I don't know if there's a if there's a kind of parallel there. That that was all I, I was wondering. But there's no Rocky in this one, so this is this is yeah. this is all new story territory. This could, this could be very very interesting indeed. Mm. But uh, I'm a, I'm excited. So Michael B. Jordan's directing this as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, lots of it'll be hopefully you know lots about it that's fresh and not just like a 
a do over or a continuation of uh, something that's been from that, something that we've seen previously from the Rocky franchise. Mm. It's tricky though, isn't it? Because when you're when you're basically nine films into a franchise, and yeah. especially with boxing, you basically only have two choices: either you know Adonis wins, wins the fight at the end of the movie, or he loses the fight <laughs> at the end of the movie. It's yeah. either he's rich at the end of the film, or he's not rich at the end of the film. So, you know, there's there's within those limited parameters, mm. there's there, there should be some scope to play around. I, I think, and uh, listen, they've they've managed to make the last two really really good. So, yeah. fingers crossed. I mean, speaking of super pumped, are, are we going to avoid the elephant-sized bicep in the room? Yes, yes, Ben, I have been working out. Thank you very much Chris indeed. Chris H is looking absolutely swole. I won't say which one. <laughs> swole and thick. Yeah. Uh, sadly, I am not talking about Chris Hewitt, but talking about Chris Hemsworth in the what? end of shooting the rap picture for... Thor Love and Thunder, which has come to a close in Australia this week. Uh, and yet to celebrate, Chris Hemsworth shared a photo standing next to Taika Waititi in his full Korg gear. It's interesting to see. I, I mean, I know we're going to basically just mm. be talking about Chris Hemsworth's arms for five minutes. So I just want to shout out quickly. Um, seeing Taika <laughs> in his full like Korg getup, he's wearing like a bodysuit that has the sort of Korg rock-esque markings. <laughs> but then he has a big like head on top of his head. For eye lines on, on for people top to of look at, yeah. it's pretty cool just getting to see how he yeah. looks when he shoots that role. But obviously, the insane mm. talking point is Chris Hemsworth's massive arm. I don't know what routine he was doing, if he's been stealing tips on The Rock or whatever, but he looks like five times bigger than he has in any Thor film so far. The, the main question this raises for me is how they're going to style out the dad bod Thor thing from Endgame, because I had some problems with the way that that played out through the kind of central part of the movie and some of the like jibes and things about that, but it actually came to quite a nice conclusion where like, no, this is me, I am Thor, this is what I look like now, I'm still as powerful as I've ever been. He has that amazing moment where he has Mjolnir and the big axe. Stormbringer is it Stormbreaker Storm, Stormbreaker <laughs> one of those was that Alex Ryder movie that we don't talk about yeah Stormbreaker and he looks also. like yeah. cool as fuck and it was like a really celebratory moment that where it felt like a sort of moment of self-acceptance so I'm, I'm intrigued to see how they go from that to like mega mega jacked Thor in this one I actually think that kind of makes sense because that body came as a result of pain and depression and, uh, you know, self-hatred, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think if this body might indicate he's in a happier place and... I do think it looks different, but I think it looks different in the way that bodybuilders in the 80s look different to bodybuilders, or at least on screen now. And I feel like this might be almost a midway point. So he's still got some of that dad bod heft to him and bulk to him, but actually, you know, has has lost some of the kind of despairing aspects maybe of that body, which is not to say that everyone who has that body has that reason for it or that those two are always connected or anything like that. Um, I, I don't mean any, any disrespect that way. I just mean that I think in this character's case, that body signified certain emotional things. I think this body also sort of, you know, signals certain emotional things. Development, Talking about the 18, 80s-ness, have we noticed his hair is like crimped in this one? <laughs> I know, right? It's proper Fabio. He's he's seems he's gone full Fabio. He should look out for roller coasters and geese. That's all I'm saying. It's, uh, it's a real danger for him. Yeah. yeah, I suspect that we won't be spending that much screen time with Thor and Dad Bodmer. I think it's going to be like a first act uh, change up. Wild right off a of prediction. I suspect so I as well. don't think he. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we'll see him in it at all. To be honest, I think it'll be a, a time jump, and it'll just be, it'll be him. Yeah, I think so too. Just as he is. But that's the thing about this movie. I know nothing about this movie. I mean, that's you know, we're, none of us know anything about this film, apart from the fact that Taika Waititi on on Instagram said it was the craziest film he's ever done, mm. which is saying Promising. something. Given mm -hmm. that the last Thor movie had a giant wolf and a big old fire demon that destroyed a planet and mm. Jeff Goldblum. So and his last <laughs> film was the Hitler comedy. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there, it's very, very exciting indeed. Who knows what this movie may be? Hopefully it'll be amazing. Well, one door closes and another one opens just as Thor Love and Thunder wraps. Indiana Jones, the fifth, <gasps> but I keep calling it the fifth film. Very confusing. Start <laughs> shooting in the UK next week. Yes. <laughs> It's exciting. The first Indiana Jones film since 1989. Uh, you may feel that Harrison <laughs> Ford might be a little old, but uh, it's not the years, it's the mileage. Exactly. Or, does that make sense? Anyway, 
Hopefully he hasn't got too many miles on the clock. Uh, yeah, we've talked about this in the past. They've got a good cast going on. Yeah, really good. Jim Mangold's directing. We like him. Um, Jim? I don't think this is going to get the Logan. Yeah, Jim. That's what uh-huh. he likes us to call him. It's fine. Okay. We've, we've interviewed him, Helen. He, he prefers, he's, he's more of a Jim than a James. All right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think that this is going to get the sort of elegaic treatment that led Logan got. I think this, yeah. hopefully this is going to have a bit, bit more of a, a caper quality to it. I think so. Well, I think, you know, people like Matt Mickelson and Phoebe Waller-Bridge have a lot of kind of caper energy or are capable of caper energy. Oh, that's fun to say. So I think <laughs> that could really add something to it. And then obviously They're Boyd capable. Holbrook. Hey, and Thomas Kretschmann and so on as well. Uh, yeah, this this sounds fun. I'm I'm hoping it'll be. And they're awesome. starting shooting in the northeast, which makes me wonder what the MacGuffin might be this time. I think it might be the original Greg's in Gosforth in Newcastle, um, seeking out the original <laughs> Greg sausage roll or something like that. I think that would be a great uh, a great kind of wow. mystical object for Indy to be after the this true time. True Grail. Mm. Anything else? Margot Robbie is starring in the film with Margot Robbie, aka Samar Weaving. <laughs> <laughs> it's like looking in a mirror only not yeah um samara weaving has joined the cast of babylon uh babylon yes yeah, so this, this is going to be directed by damien chazelle and the cast now is max Minghella, lucas haas flea roy scoville samara weaving Emma, eric roberts damon gupton and uh margot Robbie and brad pitt uh, among others so yeah intriguing Intriguement, as they say in France. Cool stuff. Anything else? The Nine Gorilla, um, she's getting her own Okoye series on Disney+, Plus, which is very exciting. See, um, that's interesting. Again, this is at the rumour stage. Nothing's been announced. So that's a report I read as well, that she's going to get uh, her own show. But I also assumed it was going to be the just she was going to head up show, the... Yeah. Dora Milaje show, the the, yeah. the Wakanda show that Ryan Coogler's working on. Is that what, what do we think? I think either would work, but I'm just happy that we're getting more focus on Okoye regardless, because um, that's a character. There's so much story to tell. In the recent issue of Empire, I, was, uh, I wrote about the World of Wakanda series that Roxanne Gay uh, co-wrote, which is a fantastic series that any Black Panther fan should seek out and read, because it focuses, it puts the focus on the Dora Milaje and and how they relate to T'Challa, uh, what they think of their royal duties. And the, uh, one, one storyline actually sees them sort of break away from T'Challa and sort of act sort of on their own volition. And given sort of what's happening in the MCU right now, um, it'll be interesting to see how much of that type of story and that, that comic they emulate, mm. whether it's in the Wakanda series or whether it's in uh, Black Panther 2 and beyond. Uh, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I still love that title, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. And it's just, I yeah. think it's, we're, we're just, it's because what's great about it is I think it'll slowly, I think people begin to call it Wakanda Forever yeah. rather than Black mm-hmm. Panther 2. And I think that'll, sl- I think that's almost what they want. They want to leave the Black Panther name on its own pedestal. I, th- I think that's what they're aiming for with this. Just one last thing I wanted to talk about. This is an outrage. Paddington 2 is no longer the best reviewed film of all time, <laughs> thanks to Misery McFistshake, uh, a critic who found a negative review from 2017 in which he growled at children. I mean, like, why, like, why worry? You know, it's still p- perfect and wonderful and beautiful. And I've read that review and it was not compelling, I didn't think, in its arguments against it. So let's just all pretend it doesn't exist. That person gets the hard stare to the absolute max. I, I don't even think it's worth a hard stare. Just, you know, let's all send them a nice pop-up book and wish them a happier day. That's what Paddington time. would do. But I'm not Paddington. I'm a person who's angry about the mistreatment of Paddington. <laughs> and I will give him a hard stare. Oh, boy. I've sent around the boys to break his legs. Should That's I call cool. them off? I mean, I, yes, as your lawyer, Chris, you should definitely call them off. Yes. <laughs> okay. Ben, I'm on. Uh, it's fine. It's off, lads. It's off. It's oh. off. Can we still have the Understood. marmalade sandwiches you promised us? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, of course you can. Uh, and so I should also mention that we only have, by the time you're listening to this on Friday, you only have, I think, four days, maybe five days left to pick up the latest issue of Empire, which is the issue that has Tom Cruise on the front, uh, being all Tom Cruisey, riding around a bike and saving cinema and leaping off cliffs and jumping between trains and all that sort of stuff. It's a tremendous issue. It also has the... 
2021 preview. So all the movies that are going to be coming up in cinemas over the next few weeks and months. It is cracking, cracking. But you only have five days, if you listen to this on Friday, to pick it up. Because after that, it's replaced by Ben. The not newly, by Ben, but... No, not by me. <laughs> yeah, I, I will be on ben. all good news sense. Uh, <laughs> yes. from, no, uh, we've just announced the super exciting new issue of Empire, which is going to be on sale next week. And this is the British New Wave issue. We have four amazing covers. This whole issue is a massive celebration of this incredible generation of British talent, both in front of and behind the camera. So many exciting people involved in this issue with major new interviews, uh, exclusive brand new photo shoots. uh, And the four covers, right, first up we have Riz Ahmed, amazing, just the best dude, sound and metal, amazing. Uh, we have Emerald Fennell behind Promising Young Woman and the second season of Killing Eve. Then we have Kingsley Benadir, who um, you probably saw most recently in One Night in Miami. He's absolutely incredible. And finally, we have Bucky Backray from Rocks on the cover of Empire with these amazing, amazing new shoots. And inside the magazine, there's, I think, 24. There's over 20 interviews with all of these super exciting people. So you've got filmmakers like... Rob Savage, Remy Weeks, Rose Glass, uh, Christy Wilson Cairns, Kate Heron, Prano Bailey Bond, uh, and stars people like Gemma Chan, Shobo Dirisu, uh, Morford Clark, uh, Henry Golding, Olivia Cook, Jessica Yuli Hemwick, like all these insanely exciting people who are doing just the best stuff at the moment and are really defining this British talent that is sweeping out into the wider British and Hollywood landscape. Uh, So you'll be able to find that on newsstands from Thursday, uh, the 10th of June, and you can pre-order those now on greatmagazines.co.uk. So yeah, go and get your copy now because it looks amazing. So go to a good or evil news agent on Wednesday and pick up the Tom Cruise issue and then read that and then come back the next day and pick up any one of those four covers or even better, all four covers and your sex life will be miraculously improved. Oh, wow. Not because of the issue. I, I, I just, oh God. Anyway, that is it for the movie news section, which means it is now time for our third and final guest on this week's episode. And it is the one and only... The wonderful, the pickiest of all the blinders himself, Mr. Killian Murphy. Fantastic Irish actor. Of course, you will have seen him in 28 Days Later, The Wind That Shakes the Barley, you throw a stone at a Chris Nolan movie. Chances are you'll hit Killian Murphy in it. Uh, he is, of course, in Free Fire, Ben Wheatley's Free Fire as well. He is a DJ on Six Music, and he also pops up in a little show called Peaky Blinders and... John Krasinski's A Quiet Place Part 2, which is a sequel, of course, to A Quiet Place. Uh, And Killian in it plays a mysterious stranger called Emmett, who may or may not be able to help Emily Blunt and her family in this post-apocalyptic landscape. And speaking of post-apocalyptic landscapes, we're kind of living in one right now, thanks to the pandemic, which delayed the release of A Quiet Place Part 2. It was one of the first movies to really be delayed and pushed back. It was about to start screening to journalists, as you're about to hear me explain to Killian in the interview a year ago or a year or so ago before everything started going to shit. So that's where we start talking about. Uh, We also talk about what attracted him to the film, of course, uh, what's keeping him going in the pandemic and the concept of the acting holy grail. Always have a good time talking to Killian Murphy. He is a sound and very thoughtful actor indeed. So here we go. Me talking to Killian Murphy. Do please enjoy. We're delighted to be joined on the Emperor Podcast by the star of A Quiet Place Part 2, Mr. Killian Murphy. How the devil are you, sir? I'm grand. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. I can't complain. Um, This is a conversation that we were meant to be having, I think, roughly 16 months ago, uh, because people had started seeing, in the journalist fraternity, people had started seeing A Quiet Place Part 2, and then obviously everything started shutting down. And uh, what was that experience like from your perspective, from your side of things? Because you must have been gearing up for this big publicity push at the same time. Yes, it was very strange, very odd. We, we, I actually went to New York to do the premiere, and we did, I was there for about five days, and it was just... uh, when everything people it was reaching that pitch where everyone went okay this is really serious and things are starting to shut down um like you know but people were thinking it was serious but then hoping it wasn't serious you know nobody was everyone was so unsure and uncertain and then by the time i arrived back home in dublin uh the schools were shut in dublin and the film was pulled and 
and I was supposed to start shooting Peaky Blinders that was pulled so everything changed in about or during that flight <laughs> when I flew home so uh, it was bizarre 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 yeah, absolutely. Um, what did you do to kind of keep yourself sane in those first few months? I know that you uh, you said recently that Six Music um, obviously helped you with that. Was that was that the main thing for you, music and throwing yourself into that? Yes, you know, it definitely. Music has always been a um, a support for me all, all my life. Um, but I, but like everybody else, we try we try to make the most of it, you know. Uh, and I never had that length of time off. With, my family was the longest I've ever been at home. I was at home for 18 months. Um, so that was because I had been at home for six months before the first lockdown happened. And then we had the year. Um, so we tried to make the most of it. Of, of it. Um, but I don't know if people are still, you know, at enough of a distance to be able to process it. I certainly don't know if I am enough to be able to give you a coherent or enlightening answer about that you know i'm still still figuring it out really yeah absolutely it's a it's a day but it's a day by day process uh for sure but yeah but but now the film is coming out quiet place part two is coming out um ha- have you needed a refresher course in the movie because it's been obviously a long time since you shot it um did you have to go back and see it again just to remind yourself of what it was about and what was happening I didn't see it. I would love to actually see it again. I don't generally like watching my own films, but watching that film in a cinema with an audience was amazing because it is pure cinema. I mean, it, it demands to be watched in a dark room with a load of strangers. You know, it's that sort of experience. I haven't seen it since, um, but it's very vivid in my mind, the making of it even though it was two years ago now I, and, and it was, it was such a pos- hugely positive experience for me, the work and, and the, uh, and my relationship with John and Emily. And, you know, it's been a really, it's I have a great affection for the whole, for the people involved and for the film. In what way was it a, a, a very positive experience for you? And what, it, 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 it's remained vivid in your mind. Was there something specific about it? It felt well, you know. I'd never, I'd never come on board of, uh, uh, um, for a sequel. I'd never done that before, and so it was a very well established uh, little uh, environment and community they have. You know, because John and Emily obviously are, are are a couple, and they have their kids. And then Noah and Millie knew each other so well from the first one, and and they welcomed me in really uh, in a lovely way into that atmosphere. And then we shot it in upstate New York during the summer, and it was. It was just, it was beautiful. And, and I know the movie is quite heavy sometimes in its themes and what it's dealing with. But I, all I just remember is, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of laughing and, and, um, and a lot of like uh, sore legs, but then just meeting up for dinner. And it was just a good, good time. And, 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 and also a, a really, um, a deep feeling that we're making good work, you know. John Krasinski is outrageously talented, like as as a as a as a writer and as a director and as an actor. It's 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 insane how good he is, you know. And to arrive that fully formed as a director is 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 something else. So I trusted him implicitly, and he gives brilliant notes. And then I've I've been a huge admirer of Emily Blunt for many many years, and I've never I never met her or worked with her. But to act with a you know. Uh, uh, someone of that quality, it was, it's always such a treat, you know, and we had very charged, very intense scenes. So it was just a, it was a really good time, a really good job. What sort of things do you look for in directors? I mean, you know, you've obviously worked with some amazing directors over the years, you know, Ken Loach and Danny Boyle and Chris Nolan, just to name but three. Um, you know, so is there, do they have shared characteristics? Do you like to sit down and interrogate directors before you you work with them generally uh, generally i've been fans of their work before i've worked works with them like all of those directors that you mentioned i would have been fans of their work like i would have had a train spotting poster on my bedroom wall you know like i would have seen memento in the cinema you know i would have watched uh kez you know growing up i would have watched sweet 16 you know you know so so first and foremost, I'm a fan, 
And then I guess you know that that director then has a huge, hugely strong and confident vision. And your role then is just purely to help them achieve that vision and to do the best you can in, 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 in making the thing, the, the, the piece of cinema work. That's, that's what I really feel my role is uh, in the work. And with, with John, though, there is perhaps less of a body of work there, but you have the first Quiet Place as a director. Obviously, you know, he, yeah. was, he was in the office for a few years. Uh, we know what he can do as an actor. Uh, but I had, yeah. a similar, I had a, think I had a similar experience with uh, A Quiet Place in that I saw it and I thought this is, a, this is an instant uh, classic, if that's not uh, yeah. an oxymoron. And this is a fantastic piece of filmmaking. Where has this guy been hiding all, all this time? Did you have a similar yeah. experience watching that movie? Because watching that movie with an audience was something else. Yeah, I, I had the exact same experience to the point where I drafted an email to John Krasinski after the, watching the first one because I was so blown away by the film. It was my favourite film of that year. I wrote an email or drafted an email to him saying, look, man, you don't know me from Adam, but I just think that was an extraordinary achievement, what you did. It broke my heart. It, it made me cry. It was a stunning piece of work. But I never sent the email. <laughs> so uh, so I, got, I just chickened out at the end. I got too embarrassed. I never sent the email. But then he emailed me a year later. So there was some sort of, some, some good serendipity going on there. Um, so yeah, but but my thing about that thing about you you, you know you, you you can learn the mechanics of a of a film set. You can learn what lenses to use and where to put a camera. But to 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 innately know how to tell a story and to get that reaction from an audience and to have that emotional visceral response to create that, you can't learn that. That's just something you have, and he has that. This movie is, I guess, inadvertently, I don't know if this is deliberate or not, but this is the third part of the Killian Murphy Apocalypse trilogy. So obviously you have 28 Days Later, you have Sunshine as well. And now it's obviously three movies studded across a, a fantastic career across many, many years. But is this a genre or is this a, a theme that you yourself are drawn to, this idea of surviving in a post-apocalyptic world and what that means? I never think of films in genres. I, I genuinely don't. Uh, like I, I, I think of them in terms of good films or bad films or good scripts or not good scripts. And that is all I'm attracted to and, uh, is, is good scripts or original scripts or you know, conceptually interesting scripts. Um, and so it just happens that, th that these films, I suppose, pro sort of fall into those categories. I do think they're, they're all quite uh, different, um, but there are just scripts that I read and went, this is seriously good writing. These are seriously good directors. I, I, I would like to be involved. And I never for a minute, I don't think an actor, any actor does think, oh, this is another, this is another, uh, you know, horror or thriller or whatever. They, they, I, they don't think about that. You just think this could be a great film. I think this is a good part I, 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 I could do something with. Just going back to this this idea that you almost manifested this this movie into being for you by by not sending the email to John Krasinski, um, did you not send it to him because you were trying to guess his email address or what was it about? <laughs> and you just thought, uh, I'm not sure. Is it John Krasinski at AOL dot com? I'm I'm not entirely sure. Or you know, were you thinking to yourself, I, I don't know. Was there a reason why you didn't press send on that email after all? I think I have I have. I have form in like pestering directors. I've done it earlier in my career where I've really wanted part and I've, 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 you know, emailed and got in contact and, and kept pursuing roles. Um, but in this case, I just felt, I, I just felt, uh, he's going to think that I want something or I, or he's going to think that I'm just kissing his ass or, you know, where I wasn't, I was just being a fan. But I think, I think we're, we're actors are a little bit too, um, nervous about that so when you actually do meet someone and you say oh man i'm a huge fan of your work they're genuinely touched by it and they genuinely appreciate it but because everything in in our business is true genuine is generally through intermediates like through agents 
you rarely get to see other people unless you work with them or you meet them at a social event. I don't go to any of those. I don't ever see people. So, uh, so I think it's, it, it is nice when you, when you actually do reach out on that occasion. I just, I just, um, I lost faith. I lost confidence in myself, but I'm glad I didn't now because it worked out. Presumably you told John this. Oh, many times we, 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 yeah, he takes the piss out of me about it all the time. <laughs> and does it work the other way? Do you get, uh, you know, do you get uh, young actors now coming up to you or, or send you emails and send new stuff uh, as, as well? Um, I, it, it happens uh, um, when I do theater because, you know, people will come and see the play and they'll come and meet you after the play. And, um, just because then, you know, you're sort of, you're socially available there, but generally I just go home and don't, I don't really see many people. So, but it's nice when you do a play and you go and you meet and you meet other actors and you can have a discussion about stuff, you know? You sound a lot like, uh, a lot like me, Killian. You sound like you were hermetically sealed before the pandemic. So when the pandemic came along, it was like, it hadn't really changed. Yeah, I do like my home comforts, I have to say. I'm quite happy being at home. Thing is, I can work from home because this is what I do. I just, you know, I talk to people and I, I, you know, write stuff. But it's difficult for an actor, I guess, because you need to be out there, right? You need to be out there creating and and waiting for, you know, waiting for things to happen must have been quite tricky, I guess. Yes, but what I've realized is that what works for me is to work very, very intensely. Like I'm, I've been away from home now for five months doing Peaky Blinders, so. I work very, very intensely and then I'll take a long period of time off. And that seems to balance out then, you know, what I couldn't do is the continuous thing of working job to job to job. I, I don't have the stamina for that. Um, and I don't have the, the sort of emotional space in my head for that, but, but I can go, I can go hard and like get really involved and like immerse myself in something and then just leave it all behind. Without giving too much away about the movie and about your character uh, as well, um, there is a lovely relationship between you and Melissa Simmons' character in the movie. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to her for the magazine a, a few weeks ago. She's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what was that yeah. experience like working with with her and working on those scenes? Oh, I mean, she's she's properly sensational. You know, she's so good i remember that in the cinema seeing it the first one you just couldn't she has this presence you know she has in person and she has on screen and that's something you can't learn either that's just that's just uh star presence uh and i i loved observing her when we were working because she she could just exist in a scene you know she didn't need to think about it or intellectualize it she could just exist in a scene and we're always chasing that as an actor that's the that's the sort of the holy grail of acting is to just be just to just exist and she does it effortlessly has that happened for you when, when was the last time you, you you achieved that that holy grail oh man i i, I don't know I, it, it, you're always a, a, after it and it comes and it goes and you know you're always after it uh, and sometimes you might think it's happening with the other actors going, man, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it happens. It can happen easier on stage because you're playing out the whole story, the whole narrative in order uh, for real, it feels like. So it can happen. It's much easier to achieve that state on stage because film is just, you know, acting in moments, telling stories in, in tiny little moments. Um, but it's also, you know, she's a young performer and uh, she's not old and cynical like me. So she's just got, she's just got it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, listen, I will, I will let you go. And long may your pursuit of the Holy Grail of acting continue. It's been a pleasure. Uh, once again, Killian Murphy, thanks so much. Indeed. Nice to chat to you, man. Likewise. Mind yourself. Take care. And now we're in home stretch, folks. It is time to talk about the movies that are out this week in actual cinemas, actual goddamn cinemas. We can actually sit down in an actual goddamn seat with actual goddamn popcorn and point your actual goddamn eyes at the actual goddamn screen Good and Lord. see light projected through an actual goddamn projector. It's the most amazing thing. I'm sorry for the swearing, folks. I know that this is usually a PG podcast and I've maybe bumped it up to PG-13 with all <gasps> my, you know, goddams and stuff. But uh, what can you do? I'm just so... 
chuffing excited about these movies. Starting with, of course, A Quiet Place Part 2. John Krasinski's return to the territory of A Quiet Place Part 1, <laughs> which uh, came out a couple of years ago, took everyone by surprise, and for my money is one of the best horrors of the last, well, let's say, mm, 36 months. That's amazing, Chris. Wow. High Thank praise. You. Uh Yeah. Yeah, this is this was um, one of the very first big films uh, knocked back by the pandemic. I have, I still have the ticket to last year's screening, which was the first <laughs> big one cancelled. It still breaks my heart. But finally, we're here and we've seen it, and and I really, really enjoyed it, uh, and I was so glad that I did. So uh, we pick up pretty much immediately after the end of the first film. If you see, haven't seen the first film, there may be some spoilers, but I'm going to try and tiptoe around them um, quietly. But of course, <laughs> the the, uh, the world is plagued by these alien invaders who hunt by sound and even a sneeze can get you killed. So our little family of heroes uh, set out to find a new home after the near destruction of their own last time. Emily Blunt has, of course, just given birth to a new baby um, as the mother of the family. Um, she's got her two uh, children with her, played by Noah Jupe and Millicent Simmons. And uh, they have to find a new place of safety, new people to help, um, and especially somewhere to keep the baby where it's crying will not be heard, uh, which is going mm. to be no mean feat. So th the kind of journey this time takes them to a, a neighbour, uh, played by Killian Murphy, uh, who has had his own struggles during this this period, this alien invasion um, period, and um, rather reluctantly agrees to perhaps maybe offer some kind of help, possibly, but it's still going to be a tough uphill battle for them all to kind of figure out what to do next. And so this film is a little bit less focused than the last one, because it, what ends up happening is essentially that everybody goes off on their own missions. So, you know, the baby needs some supplies. Um, the baby also needs to be watched and yes. be looked after. And, the baby and also, doesn't go off on his own mission, by the way. No, no, the baby, the baby, I should say, does not have an independent story arc here particularly. Baby stay out in this world would be the <laughs> that funniest would be disastrous. thing. Disastrous, <laughs> my God. Um, it would be a short film. <laughs> maybe it would be uh, exactly the same, but, you know, the miraculous things that kept saving the baby that time would save the baby again. <laughs> anyway, but Millicent Simmons Reagan kind of becomes the lead this time because she is obviously a deaf character and uh, her father's tinkering with her hearing aid proved to be a decisive weapon uh, in the last film, spoiler, against these monsters. And she is determined to use this now and to sort of pay this forward to weaponize this further against them and it sets out to try and do something bigger and more e extravagant to help and of course that's not going to be super duper easy either so it's like i say it's less focused and maybe less pure than the last one we have a flashback to the day the aliens came so the timeline is a little bit a little bit more complicated as well but still, I think what worked really well last time works really well here. The premise, while, you know, it's nonsensical if you think about it for more than about a minute, but it works really, really well on screen, really well. And I think John Krasinski is a director who is very, very good at, at switching between these, these storylines without losing the tension and the pace of any of them. Because you know there are some stories where you flick back from one character to another and your heart goes, oh God, it's this guy again. Like that <laughs> did not happen to me at any point in this one. I was totally involved in everybody's little arc. I was very much on board for everybody surviving and getting out of this in one piece. And I wasn't sure that they would. So uh, yeah, I thought I thought this was really, really, really effective. Like I say, maybe it doesn't quite have the freshness of the first one, but it's a pretty close run thing, I think. Yeah, for me, this actually really lived up to the first one for the most part. I think if you're going into this expecting it to do something radically different with the concept, it doesn't. But I think what it does do is take a concept that was so good first time around, where you could go, oh, if you just keep doing this again, it's going to get less effective. And it basically remains as effective as it was first time around. I think they find really, really kind of clever and interesting setups of what to do. On the one hand, it's a much bigger film. It's a much more open film but they find constructs in it that actually there are moments that are more claustrophobic for me than they were in the first film. They end up in some literal tight spots at various points in this film. The level of suspense, I think, is just really, really clever. Like That's what I loved about the first one, is that it's, it is a horror movie, but it is just pure suspense. It is those amazing like Spielberg set pieces in a 
sort of feature length presentation and the opening of this especially is just Spielbergian to the max and mm. I loved that opening sequence so much I thought it was brilliant uh, the way that they there are all these little setups and kind of uh, flashes of life and yeah it's just so so smartly done uh, you can tell Krasinski knew exactly what he, what he wanted to do with that opening with the way back into this whole world and um yeah i think i thought it just did a really nice job of continuing everything continuing the characters opening the world up without making it feel any less special and based on what he's managed to do here i would be first in line for a quiet place part three yeah now that opening sequence i completely agree with you and i'm just it just makes me so happy that they decided to delay this and delay this until cinemas were back because that opening sequence for that alone, that is why you go and watch this film in the cinema. And this was my first film back. I went to watch it with Helen and Beth, and it was in an IMAX. And just being back uh, in that environment for this film was amazing. But uh, but yeah, I, I enjoy this. I think the first one is better because I just prefer the way that film builds its tension. Because uh, the first one, I think, builds its, build, builds its tension and builds its tension to like a really thrilling climax. Whereas this one, because it's opening up the world, it loses a bit of that uh, by nature as to what it's trying to do uh, with this film. But, um, you know, I agree with uh, everything you're saying about about Millicent Simmons. I think Killian Murphy is fantastic in this Mm. and really sort of earns that character arc as the film goes on. And yeah, uh, it was was good and it was not so good being back in a dark room for horror again. Um, I was... (laughs) just doing at the screen wildly at points because there's as i told helen afterwards you know i know that they're kids i know that we should be giving them but some of the decisions that characters make in this i'll just like come on but not not too much yes you have to wonder how the kids got through this far into the pandemic without or the pandemic sorry the alien invasion (laughs) sorry freudian um (laughs) you have to wonder how the kids got this far into the alien invasion without you know, sassing their parents and storming off in a half in tears uh, at some point and getting eaten. Mm. But at the same time, it does it does ring true that they might occasionally re- have a moments of rebellion. And we saw that in the first film to a degree. And I think it wasn't wildly out of character. They weren't making the kind of completely insane character choices that some horror films force upon their their cast, I didn't think. So I like that. And I would like to, it, to note for the record that both Amon and I were extremely brave during the film and nobody cowered behind their hands or coat at <laughs> any course. point. So yeah. I, yeah. Lo- I loved that. I, I've seen the film twice now, both times in cinemas, but not with a packed audience, both times at, at screenings with, you know, critics growling at each other and, uh, and mm-hmm. you know, just being generally miserable. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did want, the first time I watched the, the first one was with my wife and we had an ill-judged snack and it was oh, the, no. the second that you're into the movie it's like oh i can't eat this yeah. well, could, a because i'm terrified but also uh b i don't want to make a noise and th- that is brilliant i mean this is a film that for me puts the die into diegetic sound and uh it is absolutely it's not as good as the first movie for me it's not quite as fresh as the first movie there's a little bit more in terms of the you know maybe it's a bit more contrived in the first movie but listen we have a spoiler special to get into that because uh we've uh, i interviewed john krasinski for a spoiler special for a quiet place part two so listen if you're not subscribing to our spoiler special channel what the hell are you doing you're gonna miss out there's gonna be a quiet place part two spoiler special with john krasinski john krasinski and it's gonna be up I think next week. So it's going to be exciting. But yeah, I thought this was great. Not quite as good as the first one, but the first one for me is a modern classic. So that's 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 okay. It's fine to fall just short of that. And it had me tense and nervous all the way through. Job done. But I thought we were a little bit harsh in this, if i be honest. We gave us three stars mm. uh, as a magazine. So Empire has given us three stars. But if I fell in line behind it, but I, ax- but I kind of carried an extra star behind my back. If you were to have an extra star upon your yeah. person and one fell out Look, whilst battling I mean, one of these creatures. That could happen. It could happen. It absolutely <laughs> could happen. Three stars then for A Quiet Place Part 2. And next up we have After Love. After Love. Amon. What is After Love? Tell us about it. This is the first feature from Aleem Khan, and it stars Joanna Scanlon as Mary. She is a British Muslim convert, and she is devastated when her husband uh, suddenly dies. That's like the opening to the pre-credit sequence of the film. 
And as she's sorting out his personal effects, uh, she discovers that uh, her late husband was living another life in France. And she decides to journey to France to uh, learn the truth and find out what that life was and who it was with. Uh, so that is what the, the crux of this one is, is about. And the main reason, you know, come for Joanna Scanlon, stay for Joanna Scanlon, we watch for <laughs> Joanna Scanlon, we wind for Joanna Scanlon, Joanna Scanlon. Uh, that is my view of Oslo. No, um, she is, <laughs> she That's is fair. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> she is absolutely incredible in this film. Uh, it's just basically about, uh, it f- focuses on her and her sort of, you know, discovering this life that uh, her late partner had and really how that affects her and how that affects other people that were in uh, his orbit in his life. Mm. And the performance is just so beautiful uh, and agonizing and intimate. And her expressions just tell you so much. A lot of her best work is when she's not actually saying anything at all. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's just a really, really amazing performance. I also love that, you know, I, I mentioned at the top, she's a British Muslim convert. That's never sort of, they don't focus on that aspect of her life as much as I, I could see other films which would, and this doesn't do that, although mm. it addresses it in a really uh, interesting way. Yeah. And I liked how they handled that too. Um, so yeah, but you know, the, the, the performances across the board are great, but Joanna Scanlon in, in particular really knocked me out. There wasn't sort of one singular moment where I had like a really big emotional reaction, like a really, uh, that, that really hit me in the gut. But all the way through, uh, it's really, really powerful uh, stuff. I, yeah. I really, really liked it. Yeah, it's underplayed and sort of slow and quiet and almost kind of doesn't draw attention to itself, which all fits in with her character beautifully. So I feel like the, the film mm. really, really reflects who she is. Um, but, but also, yeah, you're right. It doesn't go for the sort of easy answers, you know, even though... Uh, you know, it's it's clear that, for example, that converting was her choice. It wasn't something mm-hmm. that was forced upon her. It wasn't sort something that was, in any way, imposed from outside. And it's not. It doesn't become part of her dilemma or her kind of her trauma here. If anything, I think it's a it's a, a place of support and a place of love and a place of comfort for her. And I thought that was good because I think another film might have taken a very different tack on that. I just thought it was. Um, yeah, really, really beautifully done. But you're right, Joanna Scanlon, Joanna Scanlon, Joanna Scanlon. That's the reason to say it. She's so good, yeah. and she's look. She's been. She's one of those dependable people. But like, this is kind of beast mode stuff. You know, it really is. Yes, four stars indeed for After Love, and the last film this week is uh, a film that I've got into my head. It's called Fish Pie, and I have no idea why. It's not. <laughs> I'm your dream horse. Boy. Never mind. It's Dream Horse, which is. It's nothing like a fish pie. No. <laughs> but yeah, Dream Horse. Ben, yes. take us home on the Dream Horse. Dream Horse is about a horse who, when he falls asleep, <laughs> his dreams come to wild no. life across the... <laughs> Are his dreams about fish pies? <laughs> I think so. Are you getting confused with A Quiet Place? Hey. <laughs> uh, Dream Horse is about a woman who falls asleep and she dreams of a horse and it comes to life in... No, this no. is... Uh, what a... the fuck is this film about, <laughs> <laughs> You have three minutes. <laughs> this film is about Tony Collette playing a woman called Jan, who uh, lives in a no horse town in Wales and uh, is kind of fed up with her life working a supermarket job. Her kids have gone off to live their lives elsewhere. And she decides to start a syndicate uh, with a local community to raise a racehorse, the horse of all their dreams, uh, and to put him forward into all of the fancy horse races uh, through Wales, uh, fighting against the kind of slightly stuffy establishment that that kind of whole place is. And uh, yeah, they put all their dreams into the horse. And do you think the horse will win the race? You'll have to watch it and find out. This is like a real classic sort of British crowd pleaser. Yeah. Uh, crowd. It's, it's kind of an underdog sports movie meets the kind of British Under community horse, rallies surely. together to, to do try and fulfil a dream. And will it come to fruition in that kind of tradition of the full Monty and Fisherman's Friend and 
And the Englishman who films. went up a hill and came down a racehorse and that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, no, not like that. Oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my word. Anyway. More fan fiction from Helen. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, this is a perfectly lovely, pleasant film. It's directed by Euros Lin, who is a name that I recognise from various episodes of Doctor Who and things. Um, and I believe this is his first feature. And I thought it was a perfectly charming a very kind of very predictable but safe and enjoyable and sweet mix of genres like i said those sports tropes are all there mm. uh, played in the exact order that you think they would be but tony collette tony collette tony collette she is really good <laughs> in this she is obviously just an amazing amazing actor um and she really actually gives this some heft like you really really you're behind the dream horse who is called Dream Alliance. But really, you're behind Jan and the way that the horse kind of rallies everyone in the community. Uh, Jan's husband is kind of having a bit of a sad time or is just a bit disconnected from things and it kind of brings him back to life a bit. It brings everyone in the community back to life. I should also say Damien Lewis plays an insurance guy who helps them along with the with getting the whole horse scheme going. He's a bit of a shifty character, but will <gasps> he come good in the end? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's no, yeah. It, it, this is really kind of take your granny along kind of cinema. Like it's yeah. really very safe, very very comforting, very cozy. But Tony Collette, to my ears, pretty much nailed the Welsh accent. I, I look forward to being corrected by any Welsh listeners. Um, but <laughs> it sounded pretty good to me, and it is based on a true story. So even though a lot of those you know underdog tropes felt very tired, like you know we've got to give it some credit for them actually happening for the most part. So. Uh, yeah, and even though I looked up the real story first and actually knew what was going to happen, I still find some of the racing scenes quite tense. So, uh, you know, I do want to give it a little bit of credit for that because I thought that was quite well done. So, yeah, if you need something cozy, especially after you've just watched After Love, maybe, this might not be a bad option. Indeed. Or A Quiet Place Part 2. Or A Quiet Place Part 2. <laughs> By the way, the yeah. true story of that, I, I looked up before I saw the film as well. And <laughs> really? it's quite marked changes. Wow. wow. <laughs> First of all, a disclaimer, a friend of mine is actually in Dream Horse. Uh, so is he the horse? For what you... <laughs> yeah, I thought the horse was very good. Who is it? Uh, Alex Jordan, good mate of mine. Uh, he's really good in the movie, and I really, really enjoyed this. Um, ben and Helen are completely correct. It doesn't reinvent the wheel. But one, uh, the elements that are predictable are still done well. And two, the horse and uh, the race is the, the, it's really, it's tied into the town finding purpose again. And that was what really resonated with me and really what made it sort of a crowd pleaser. And you know, Helen is completely right, is completely right in that uh, all the horse, all the racing scenes were very enjoyable and very, very tense. And even even though, you know, having watched many movies of this ilk, I know what's going to happen. I was still sort of, you know, swept up in it, which was really cool. Well, don't listen to this man. He is in the pocket of Big Jordan. So <laughs> discount everything you heard him on say. Otherwise, we give this three stars. Three stars in for Fish Pie. And on that note, that is it for this week's Empire Podcast. Join us next week for more film-related fun, where we'll be joined by... Another cavalcade of guests, folks. Uh, where do we get them from? I have no idea. But we'll be joined by David Schwimmer and Nick Mohammed, stars of the Sky sitcom Intelligence, and Florian Seller, director of the Oscar-winning The Father, and one of the Oscar winners from The Father, Anthony Bloody Hopkins himself. What one part can do... Another part can do. What one part can do. Another part can do. Say with me, man. Say with me. Come on. Now that's how you do a Welsh accent. Anyway, until then, until a suspicious occasion, until we meet again, it is goodbye for my three colleagues of such lethal cunning squadcast names. The horse of all our dreams, it's Tren Bavis. Goodbye. <gasps> you answered to Tren Bavis. We know <gasps> now it was you. No. I'd love to put on yeah. my shifty moustache. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> it is goodbye from a loud pod part 467, Amon Warman. Peace. It's goodbye from Dream Helen. She's my dream Helen. Helen Hello. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> goodbye. And it's goodbye from me, a quiet place, but with a I 
because for some reason I've got fish pie in the brain, folks. I do not know why, but yes, a quiet place. Uh, I am off to ask Siri, quite frankly, what a day off is because I have one. Next Thursday, I will be missing a podcast for the first time in, I'd say, a year and a half. You will be in the capable hands next week of Dream Helen. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sorry, <laughs> Who knows what will happen? I'm sorry, just a call, the frog in my throat. Whew. Indeed. But anyway, I am off to ask Siri what a day off is. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye. Hey, Siri. Mm -hmm. What's a day off? It's Thursday, the 3rd of June, 2021. No, but I've worked today. <laughs> no. <laughs>